Witnesses include Iraq veterans and military health officials. Henry Waxman chairs this oversight hearing. It's about three hours. Committee of the committee will please come to order. Today, Congress is scheduled to go home for the annual Memorial Day recess. This is a time for special reflection on the sacrifices made by generations of American soldiers and for giving special thanks to our brave troops fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Today's hearing is about this new generation of heroes and the invisible injuries that will afflict many of these brave men and women. We're going to examine startling new figures about the number of troops that are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental illnesses. And we will focus on whether the Defense Department and the Veterans Administration are meeting the need of providing basic levels of care. This committee has a long-standing interest in the welfare of our troops. Long before the American public knew about the problems at Walter Reed, our ranking member Tom Davis was asking questions, writing letters, and holding hearings about problems that the Guard and Reserve troops encountered obtaining health care and military benefits. John Tierney, the chairman of our National Security Subcommittee, held the first hearing at Walter Reed, and he continues to take the lead as our committee examines problems with the military's health care system. <laughs> the most recent statistics on the number of soldiers suffering from mental illnesses caused by the war are staggering. Dr. Zeiss, the VA's top psychologist, will testify today about 100,000 soldiers that have already sought mental health care, while Dr. Insull, the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, predicts that many more will return from Iraq and Afghanistan with post-traumatic stress disorder. Recent figures from the Defense Department indicate that up to 40 percent of soldiers will uh, report psychological concerns. With almost one million soldiers and Marines having served in Iraq or Afghanistan during the course of this war, hundreds of thousands of troops will need screening or treatment for combat-related mental illnesses, and as, uh, as, such as clinical depression, anxiety disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Yesterday, I received a memorandum from the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health about the impact of combat-related mental health problems in my district and the surrounding area. According to the Mental Health Department, some Los Angeles area veterans service providers are reporting PTSD incidence rates for returning veterans that are as high as 80 percent. The department has also described case studies of area veterans who returned from Iraq with mental health problems. One involved a 24-year-old veteran who served two tours of duty in Iraq, but came home with PTSD and saw his life enter a downward spiral of substance abuse, homelessness, and crime. And I'd like to make uh, this memo part of the hearing record. As these accounts demonstrate, we are facing a public health problem of enormous magnitude. While often invisible, these mental health injuries are real, and if left untreated, they can devastate soldiers and their families. We'll hear today from witnesses who experience combat-related mental illnesses themselves or through a family member. Their stories are heartbreaking, and they remind us that behind each statistic lies a soldier and a family struggling to cope. I want to particularly thank these soldiers and their families for being here today. I know that the stories you have to tell us are not easy. This will be difficult to relive, but they will help us understand the magnitude of the problem and, I think, make a true difference. In our second panel, we'll hear from the Defense Department and the Veterans Administration about their readiness for the tremendous challenges that these mental illnesses will pose to the system. I know these agencies are working hard to address these problems, but I remain concerned they are not ready for the impending crisis. Indeed, the Defense Department's Mental Health Task Force has flatly stated, and I quote, the military system does not have enough resources or fully trained people 
to fulfill its broad mission of supporting psychological health in peacetime and fulfill the greater requirements during times of conflict, end quote. One of my greatest concerns is that the problem is getting worse, not better. Mental health professionals have identified three important factors that put our troops at risk of returning with mental problems. Longer deployment times, shorter rest periods at home, and multiple deployments. And they say that all three are now happening at once, creating a growing epidemic of mental health injuries. Just last month, Secretary Gates announced he was extending tours of Army soldiers deployed in Iraq to an unprecedented 15 months. Some units have found that their time at home has been cut to as few as nine months. Many of our troops are now on their second or even third deployment. There are even disturbing accounts of soldiers being ordered back to Iraq despite severe mental uh, and or physical injuries. These are dangerous practices that imperil, imperil the health of our troops. We've sent hundreds of thousands of troops to Iraq and Afghanistan, and we can never thank them enough for their service. As we approach Memorial Day, we need to recognize that it is a moral imperative that we do everything possible to prevent and treat their injuries, whether physical or mental, and give these soldiers and their families the support and care they need when they return home. I hope uh, this oversight hearing will help make this happen. I now want to call on uh, the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Davis. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. And uh, let me also thank the soldiers and their families for sharing their stories with us uh, t today. Uh, it's going to be very, very helpful to this committee. Let me also welcome some of our students from Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology uh, in Fairfax as well for being with us. We convene to discuss the inevitable, in many ways, normal human response to that inhuman of all activities, war. Psychological damage suffered by some warriors has been noted throughout the violent history of our species. Civil War doctors named it soldier's heart. Since then, it's been called shell shock, battle fatigue, combat stress, and post-traumatic stress disorder. So the questions we confront today are both timely and timeless as we ask how our nation prevents, detects, and treats the invisible but no less real wounds of modern warfare. Thanks to medical advances and proactive military health programs, we have a greater ability to screen for risk factors both before and after deployment and provide diagnosis and treatment options for that subset of service members who suffer neurological damage or symptoms of mental trauma. The former may emerge as the signature casualty of this era, as superior leadership, training, and equipment produce unparalleled combat survival rates, while the survivors come home suffering traumatic brain injuries in unprecedented numbers. Recent studies conclude up to 19 percent of returning combat veterans suffer some type of neurological damage or mental illness. Not surprisingly, similar studies find longer deployments and multiple tours correlate to much higher incidences of brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other mental health problems. National Guard members may also be uniquely vulnerable to combat uh, trauma effects. That means thousands of Americans returning from Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere need care for symptoms and syndromes that can be treated, but if left undiagnosed, could produce permanent health impairments. So today we ask, are returning warriors screened and informed of the warning signs of mental injuries? How many seek the care they need? Are relevant research-based treatments available to them? How do we sustain the mental resilience of a force engaged in a global struggle against terrorism? Ironically, one of the steepest barriers to diagnosis and treatment of combat trauma injuries appear to be psychological. The stigma of being labeled a head case in the military culture prevents many from seeking help. It allows unenlightened officers to ignore the problem, threaten exposure as a maligner, or counsel the sick to simply gut it out and drive on like good soldiers. Less than half of those identifying a mental disorder on recent post-deployment surveys sought related treatment. Many cited stigmatization among the reasons they would not seek care. And those who do seek help often face institutional and bureaucratic hurdles in a system much more attuned to treating injuries of the body than the mind. As we saw in our investigation into problems at Walter Reed, the military health care system is overburdened and often lacks adequate resources to provide quality care. Both the Department of Defense and Veterans Affairs Departments are struggling to shift fundamental health care paradigms from the treatment of middle-aged and elderly adults 
to meet the needs of 18 to 30-year-olds as the number of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans grows. The success of those ongoing health reform efforts at DOD and VA will enhance our ability to assess and meet the mental health needs of active and reserve members at home and abroad. That capacity is critical to assure the continued readiness of U.S. forces to meet global security demands. Mr. Chairman, this is an important set of issues and we thank you for convening this hearing. Every American we send into combat brings something of that experience back. We owe every one of them our respect, our gratitude, and a compassionate embrace for any who come home bruised or broken in body or soul. If the war in Iraq ended tomorrow, our obligation to understand the mental battles of current and future warriors would not. Mindful of that enduring debt, I hope the testimony of our witnesses today will shed needed light on the mental stresses encountered by today's warriors and how we can better heal the inner wounds of modern warfare. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, before we call on our witnesses and introduce them, I want to ask unanimous consent that Representative McCall uh, be uh, permitted to participate in this hearing. And without objection, we're pleased to have you with us. Uh, uh, several, a couple of our uh, witnesses are uh, Mr. McCall's uh, constituents, and I'd like to call on you to introduce them, if you would, and then uh, we'll proceed. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and good morning to you and Ranking Member Davis. I want to thank you for holding this hearing uh, on this very important issue of mental health and our soldiers returning uh, home. Uh, it's an honor for me to uh, introduce to you Richard and Carol Coons, constituents of my district uh, from Katy, Texas. Uh, today, among other things, you will hear the story of their heroic son, Master Sergeant James Coons, who served our nation for more than 15 years. Uh, despite his unconditional service, the United States, uh, in my judgment, has yet to show the memory of Master Sergeant Coons or his family its appreciation or respect for that service. As a representative in Congress, <clears throat> I and my staff have spent the past two and a half years working on behalf of the Coons family to find answers to their questions about their son's death, many of which the Army, the Department of Defense, and the administration have yet to answer. Uh, through my office, the Coons have repeatedly asked for a complete set of their son's medical records. The family has yet to receive them. We have repeatedly asked that the Army provide Richard and Carol with all of their son's personal effects, and specifically Master Sergeant Coons notebooks. The family has yet to receive them. We have asked that the Department of Army change the date of Master Sergeant Coon's death, which is listed as July 4, 2003, to the more accurate date of either July the 1st or 2nd, as indicated by the Washington, D.C. Medical Examiner's Report. The Department of Defense has yet to do so. Most of all, this nation has failed the Coons by not watching over their son the way he watched over all of us and our family for 16 years as a soldier in the Army. Sometime between July the 1st and July the 3rd in 2003, Master Sergeant Coons took his own life, a victim of post-traumatic stress disorder, on the grounds of Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And despite repeated pleas to several different people at the Walter Reed, no one went to check on Master Sergeant Coons until his death on July the 4th, 2003. Mr. Chairman, my office has sent dozens of letters, followed up with hundreds of phone calls and emails, and to this very day, the Department of the Army, Department of Defense, and the administration has yet to correct any of their mistakes or even apologize despite overwhelming evidence of their failure. Mr. McCall, what you're telling us is really very disturbing, and I want to hear from them and the other witnesses as well. We want to welcome you to our panel today. And uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Well, I'd like to, to close, uh, Mr. Chairman, by saying that I hope we can turn this tragic experience that, uh, that my constituents have gone through and experienced into a positive one in working together in a bipartisan fashion to address this very important issue. And I want to thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you. I fully uh, agree with you. Uh, we hadn't uh, uh, suggested opening statements because we wanted to go right to the witnesses, but if any member wishes to uh, take a two-minute uh, opening, we'll be glad to recognize uh, the members. Ms. Watson. Thank you so much for this hearing. And uh, I, I will take one minute to introduce a young man, uh, Todd Bowers, who's sitting 
in the second row to my left, and he's the Director of Government Affairs. He met with the message uh, committee this morning uh, to talk about these issues that we are covering in this hearing. And I do hope that he will then submit a statement according to your remarks that you made, Mr. Bowers, uh, to our committee. And uh, I just also want to add, uh, Mr. Chairman, that I am carrying a piece of legislation, H.R. 1853, the Jose Medina Veterans Affairs Police Training Act, and it's a bill that would uh, force the Department of Veteran Affairs to better prepare its police force to interact with patients and visitors at the VA uh, medical facility who suffer from mental illness. Uh, he went to a very traumatic affair when um, he was found on the floor in the VA hospital. More on that at another time, but I would hope that uh, all members would support the Jose Molina bill. It gets to, Medina, excuse me, it gets to the issue that we will cover today. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Ms. Watson. And uh, we will hold the record open to receive uh, a statement uh, so that uh, we can have that as part of our record. Uh, I'd like to now uh, call on um, um, Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and I want to thank the families for being here today. I would have requested the chair because I, many of us have been working on casework in which we've had a, simil a very similar response from the, uh, from the armed services when trying to get answers uh, for our soldiers' families. If maybe the, the chair and the ranking member would entertain uh, a way to survey our congressional offices uh, keeping confidentiality always uh, foremost in our minds to find out just how pervasive this is because it's quite evident we cannot um, ask the, uh, the Department of Defense to turn over this, this information. I think the chair and the ranking member are going to find out uh, that these families are representing uh, just a drop in the well of uh, how many of our servicemen and women have been uh, treated. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. McCollum. Uh, Mr. Braley, did you wish to be recognized? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Davis for holding this important hearing. This issue is very personal to me. Uh, my father enlisted in the Marine Corps when he was 17, served on Iwo Jima, came home and raised a family. When I was in high school, he suffered two severe bouts of depression that nobody in our family could understand. This weekend, I'll be making my 26th annual trip to his grave in a tiny cemetery located in the country in near Ewart, Iowa. Eleven years after he died, my brother, who works at a VA hospital in Knoxville, Iowa, was approached by a patient who recognized his name tag and told him about an incident that happened in 1946, right after my father returned from the war, totally unsolicited, where my father was working on a threshing crew and became overcome by the heat, was taken to the shade, and proceeded to relate a flashback experience when one of his best, best friends was vaporized by a shell burst on Iwo Jima. That is why I am so proud that this hearing is being held today, and I want to make a commitment to the witnesses who have taken time to appear before us that this body will do something to help get answers to the troubling questions that you have posed for us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Braley. Any other members wish to be recognized for a two-minute opening? Mr. Eisen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, certainly, uh, the Wounded Warriors Assistance Act uh, is, that passed yesterday uh, is, is incredibly important to what we're, we're looking to do for, in fact, the men and women who, who put their life on the line. I believe, though, that, uh, that we have to do one other thing in this committee, and that is that we have to seek very hard to be able to uh, put, our, put the war in Iraq separate from, in fact, what we're doing here today. And, and I'm looking forward in this hearing and in the work we do as a committee to recognize that the best work we do is the work we do separate from the other committees and what often goes on on the floor. And I look forward to uh, uh, to the te testimony here today, and I look forward to working with the chairman to try to get beyond the things we disagree on and take an issue we agree on, uh, like dealing uh, favorably with those who have 
not made a political statement, but in fact made a patriotic statement on behalf of our country and work together to find good solutions for them. And I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Issa. Other members? Mr. Cummings? Uh, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I wasn't going to say anything, but um, after I heard Mr. Issa, I must say this. I sit on the Armed Services Committee, and I also sit on the Readiness Committee, Subcommittee. And I cannot separate what I heard about the Coons family and what I heard about Pat Tillman and so many others. We have to have in this country trust. And that trust is earned. And I think that when things like, on the one hand, I sit on armed services where we're trying to make sure that our soldiers are given every single thing they need rested, trained, equipped. But then on the other hand, we come to this committee and we're trying to figure out why they don't get what they need if they're injured. And something very fundamental that has nothing to do necessarily with military or committees is truth. When the Coons family, and I'm so interested to hear their testimony, cannot get the truth, there is a breach of trust. And when there's a breach of trust, that's a major problem. And that's why, and I recommend the book, The Speed of Trust, because it talks about how when you, we stop trusting, either in, with regard to integrity, or we stop trusting with regard to competence, then everything slows down and our country slows down. And so uh, we cannot just separate. Mr. Isis is correct. We must find solutions. But first, we've got to figure out why we're not getting answers to questions with regard to wonderful Americans who stand up for their country, who shed their blood, their sweat, and their tears to, to, to be a part of making this country the very best it, it can be. And so I, uh, I yield back. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Wells, did you wish to be recognized? Uh, just two points. Uh, I thank the chairman and the ranking member. Uh, point one, thank you in advance uh, for coming in and sharing your story. Uh, it's hard to do, and members of Congress appreciate it. The people of America appreciate it, and the, your loved ones uh, appreciate it. We thank you very much. Uh, second, uh, the cost of the war has to include the cost of caring for the warrior. And we know that. Uh, that's why we resisted uh, exceeding the recommended cuts in the VA budget. And we're proposing to put the money we need into defense health care and the VA health care. Uh, you're coming in and testifying is helping us do the right thing. It's helping the American people understand what's really going on. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Any other members seek recognition? Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this important hearing. Uh, as it's becoming more and more obvious, the effects of war are permanent. It is beyond tragic that the soldiers lucky enough to survive the war run the risk of health problems that range from inconvenient to completely disabling or even fatal. Many of these problems are difficult to diagnose because they do not fit neatly into our clean medical categorizations. When they're hard to diagnose, disability benefits are hard to get. The awarding of benefits is delayed as the scientific literature catches up over many years to the reality of the pain experienced by the veterans on this daily basis. I'd ask the uh, chair to include uh, my entire statement in the record. Uh, I would just like to conclude by saying that the crushing burden of these health problems being borne by our veterans is tragic enough, especially when you consider they were sent to war under false pretenses. But to abandon them after they've served their duty is inexcusable. I, I, I know that our members look forward to hearing what we can uh, do to better serve our veterans at this hearing. And I thank the chair very much. Very much. Are we ready to um, proceed to the witnesses? I uh, want to introduce uh, three other witnesses in addition to Mr. and Mrs. Coons who have been uh, introduced to us already. Mrs. Tammy LeCompte is the wife of Army Specialist Ryan LeCompte who uh, uh, has completed two tours of duty in Iraq and is now stationed at Fort Carson, Colorado. 
the Kamsa are members of the Lower Brule Sioux, in, in, a Sioux tribe of South Dakota. Army Specialist Thomas Smith is a native of Lexington, North Carolina. He joined the National Guard in 1999 and went on active duty in 2003. He was deployed to Iraq in late 2005 and served in the Ramadi area. He is currently stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia. Specialist Michael Bloodworth is a Kentucky National Guardsman. Before being deployed uh, in, to Iraq in March 2006, Specialist Bloodworth studied science at Murray State University. He is currently being treated at a traumatic brain injury clinic at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. We're pleased to have all of you with us. Thank you so much to, for being here. It's the practice of this committee that all witnesses that appear before us uh, take an oath. And so I would like to ask you, each of you, to stand and please raise your right hand. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. The uh, record will show that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, we uh, have in, in, in uh, the written statements that uh, have been prepared for the record, and we'll have that in the record in, uh, in its entirety, but we'd like uh, we won't be strict on this, but we're going to run a clock that will indicate when five minutes are up. And if, if you uh, could possibly do it, that would be a good signal to um, try to uh, summarize the, the, the rest of the testimony. Uh, Specialist Smith, why don't we start with you, if that's OK? There's a button on the base of the mic, and if you'd pull it close to you. I think uh, maybe a little closer. Chairman Waxman, Congressman Davis, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify here today. I, Specialist Thomas Smith, entered active duty in October of 2003, and in beginning of 2004, I was sent to 3rd Brigade Combat Team. Uh, my MOS is 88 Mike. It's a transportation specialist. Um, in August of 2004, I was injured during a training, um, and uh, I had hurt my back. Um, I continued to seek help for this injury for the next two years, and I, I was told that I would receive a P3 profile in late 2006. I did not actually receive this profile until my medical board proceedings for my psychiatric problems were initiated. On May 22nd of 2007, I went to check on the status of my medical board proceedings, and the caseworker told me that she had found my P3 profile for my back then. Um, the date on this profile was November 27th. 2006. Um, even with this non-deployable profile, I deployed to the National Training Center and was almost deployed to Iraq. I had already endured this injury during the first deployment. I deployed to Iraq in January of 2005. Um, once in Kuwait, I was switched from HHC 130 Infantry to Bravo Company 130 Infantry. Um, while in Bravo Company 130 Infantry, my duties were as an 11 Bravo to drive Bradley fighting vehicles, foot patrols, and guard duty. During this time, I served in Bakuba, Iraq, and also Ramadi, Iraq. After redeployment to the States, I went through a brief mental health evaluation. Um, I was explained that I might soon be experiencing uh, some adverse reactions to the war, such as nightmares, flashbacks, etc., cetera, um, but that they should go away, and that was perfectly natural. Um, in September 2006, I was still experiencing symptoms to include nightmares, flashbacks, excessive anger, irritability, and an anxiety problems. These problems were and still continue to affect my daily life. In September 2006, I called the Army One Source hotline to get help. The representative set me up with an appointment with a psychologist in the community. This psychologist diagnosed me with PTSD, an anxiety disorder, and also depression. I continued to see the psychologist over the next few months. I reported to my immediate chain of command that I was seeking uh, help from a psychologist. Um, in January 2007, I was deployed to the National Training Center where I received no treatment for the month I was there. During my time there, I was not directly involved in the training and yet still had adverse reactions to the sound of explosions in the distance. 
After redeployment to Fort Benning after the National Training Center, I made an appointment to see my psychologist immediately. During our session, she expressed her concern and referred me to Martin Army Hospital to seek more help. I then gave copies of the letter of concern from my psychologist to my chain of command. Um, during my first visit with a psychologist at Fort Benning at Martin Army Hospital, uh, the psychologist also expressed his concern for my mental health uh, and the psychologist also diagnosed me with PTSD. After several visits with him, he wrote a letter of recommendation to my chain of command. The letter of recommendation said that I should not be allowed to have a weapon and be left behind for a few months for further treatment before redeploying me to Iraq. My company commander was contacted and he also visited my psychologist. My psychologist gave him a copy of this letter and expressed his concern for my mental health. My company commander said that he would take the issue to the colonel. I was not told of the colonel's decision until the day before deployment. Just hours away from the manifest on March 9, 2007, I received a phone call from a sergeant in my platoon stating that the colonel said I was deploying and I had to have my bags in at midnight that same night. At this time, I was already on the way to the hospital to have a talk with my psychologist. When I got there and after speaking with him, the decision was made to put me in inpatient care. I was immediately sent to Anchor Hospital in Atlanta due to the fact that there was no room for me at Martin Army. The psychiatrist at Anchor Hospital also diagnosed me with PTSD and depression and an anxiety disorder. I was put on medication at Anchor Hospital uh, upon uh, getting there. Um, I spent almost a week there until room was made for me at Martin Army Hospital. I was then checked into the mental health floor at Martin Army Hospital, where I was also diagnosed with PTSD and depression. I spent almost another week there and released to outpatient care. I'm still continuing my care and medication, and although it is a daily struggle, I am currently receiving excellent care. And that concludes my statement, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Mr. Bloodworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Leading Representative uh, Davis, and distinguished guests of the committee. I would like to extend my gratitude for being able to come here and uh, share my experiences. Um, my name is Specialist Michael Phillip Bloodworth, and I was deployed to Iraq with the Kentucky Army National Guard, uh, Charlie Company, 2nd 123rd Armor. I've been mobilized since uh, new November of 2005, where I was trained for six months in Camp Shelby. And in March of 2006, my squadron reached its area of operations in Iraq, where our mission was to provide convoy security. During the course of the 11 and a half months that I was in country, I logged thousands of miles uh, running convoys in places such as Tikrit and Baghdad. I was also victim to five separate IED exposures and multiple small arms ambushes through the course of that time span. On January 16th of 2007, I was injured um, as a result of an IED blast where I lost consciousness and have since then suffered other symptoms of TBI, post-concussive syndrome, and PTSD. Uh, these injuries led to my medevac to Longstuhl, Germany, where uh, my furthered care continued here at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Um, I arrived at Walter Reed Army Medical Center um, President's Day weekend, which is the same time frame when the Washington Post uh, made its story about uh, Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Um, within the first few days, I was in process into the system and uh, was beginning to receive some care for my uh, traumatic brain injury and uh, PTSD, along with the physical problems with my left knee that I've been having. <clears throat> I've been in the best of hands since my arrival here. Even though care has been slow, it is, uh, the people have been consistently uh, trying to stay with me and make sure that every day, even though it's a struggle, I'm on two feet and uh, making it to my appointments and making a recovery. Even through the changing of hands, uh, through command at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center with the Warrior Transition uh, Brigade, uh, everything has continued on track. Our new leadership has definitely taken charge and well adapted to the needs of the soldiers and tried to better the system. My treatment at Walter Reed Army Medical Center has been focused uh, first and foremost on my traumatic brain injury and secondly my symptoms of PTSD such as uh, night terrors, flashbacks, and uh, inability to sleep unless on medication. I've been involved with occupational therapy as a treatment form for my TBI and uh, 
the current treatment for my PTSD has been uh, seeing a psychiatrist at least twice a month and um, a steady regimen of uh, sedatives or um, narcotics to make me sleep at night. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. I've been uh, taking my treatment one day at a time, um, tried to remain on track through this difficult time and through the aid of everyone at the Traumatic Brain Injury Clinic and the aid of my psychiatrist and the support of my platoon sergeants and squad leaders, I'm making progress. Progress is slow, but it's better than anything. And uh, I've needed, I've definitely needed help along the way, but um, it's, it's getting better. Uh, this concludes my opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Bloodworth. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Coons. Good morning, Chairman Waxman, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee. Carol and I would like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to provide you information on the treatment of our son, Master Sergeant James C. Coons. There is nothing that can be done to help Jimmy now. However, with our information and that of the others present here today, change can and must be made in hopes of providing the proper care for our returning heroes so they may enjoy a healthy and productive life. Our story. Thursday, February 13th, 2003. Don't sweat the small stuff. This is my life. I am a soldier. With that comes an inherent amount of responsibility and self-sacrifice. All of my adult life has been spent as a soldier. I knew many years ago what I was getting myself into. I would not change anything. Yep, I'm dog tired and my body hurts, but there's not another place on the face of the planet Earth that I want to be right now. What I do now is not for me. It's about the American flag. Some folks don't have a clue. They curse it. They spit at it. They burn it. Well, one day, I will be buried with and under it. This is my generation's war, and if you are a soldier, then it's your profession, the profession of arms. Now rest easy and tell everyone not to worry. I will find my, home way, my way home again one day. These words were for my son, a United States soldier, a proud soldier who loved his country, his God, and then his family. Master Sergeant James Curtis Coons was a true soldier through and through all of his life. At a very early age, he was fascinated with anything military. Pass a truck hauling a tank or any military equipment, he would get excited. Drive by the port of Beaumont, and he would have to stop so he could watch the gear being loaded into over for overseas shipments. Pass an Army surplus store, well, we had to stop. Who would think a five-year-old kid would eat sea rations? He had to have a parachute hung above his bed. He took the harness off of it and tried to jump out of a small tree. Well, he did, and we had to cut him out of it. Our son James was born on April 3rd, 1968, in a small town in Texas. He died in July 2003 under the care of Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C. 35 years old, a military man happily married to a wonderful wife who had two beautiful daughters. 16 years of military service on a fast track for promotion and slated to attend Sergeant Major, Major's Academy in Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas in August 2003. What happened to my son? Does anyone really know? We begin to wonder, and I wonder why, if they know, won't they tell us? What we did know is this. Jimmy was doing his tour of duty in Iraq. He was always rock steady. He was strong-willed and a good spirit all of his life. But in April, May of 2003, his emails and phone calls from Iraq took on a completely different tone, a tone that alarmed us. On June 12, 2003, in an email to his mother, he said, this place has really put a beating on me. I found myself struggling to understand and deal with my own personal demons. I don't know what started this downward fall I'm in, I'm just ready to come home. I love you, Jimmy. This was the time he started complaining about not sleeping and seeing images of a dead soldier he had seen in the morgue. For some unknown reason, that image remained burnt in his mind, an image he saw over and over again in his sleep and would wake him. He sought help for the fatigue and anxiety he was experiencing and was only given medication. No one counseled him. 
No one sought to find out the underlying reason. Just take these sleeping pills, no follow-up, no more concern, just another soldier with a sleep disorder. No one cared enough to find out why. The medicine did not help. On June 17, 2003, James called his OIC and asked for help. Captain Singleton and another soldier raced to his quarters where they had to break in to find him lying semi-conscious. He was then rushed to a medical facility at Camp Doha for evaluation and treatment. He was diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. During his three-day stay at the medical facility, he was unwilling to discuss his situation with medical staff. On June 21, 2003, he arrived in Lansdahl as an outpatient. He left on a medevac flag flight on June 29th, 03, arriving at Warm Walter Reed Army Medical Center sometime around June 30th of 2003. He was evaluated upon his arrival and the evaluation did not find that he was a threat to himself or others. He had a scheduled appointment the next day and was released to his own custody with instruction to follow up at the outpatient clinic. He was sent to his room alone, had appointments set up. He never made one of those appointments. No one ever made an attempt, even after our calls, to check on him. Records indicate that James checked into his room at the Malone House. He, was ne he never left his room again. The next four to five days were a total nightmare. Carol and my daughter-in-law began calling Walter Reed the next day trying to find Jimmy. We have documentation of repeated calls to various departments trying to verify that Master Sergeant Coons had arrived at Walter Reed. No luck. No one had any information. They did have a room registered to a Master Sergeant James Coons, but no one could tell us if he was actually on the property. During this time, we were told that this is a holiday weekend and it would be difficult to get someone to check his room. Policy will not let us go into the room until three days if there is a do not disturb sign on the door. I have since found in part of the investigation papers a letter from Base Commander Kiley saying that rooms will be entered daily to check on the well-being of guests. It's not dated, so I don't know if this was prior to James or afterwards. We were passed around and around. A call to the hospital's clergy, a captain told us, he's a senior non-commissioned officer. I cannot get into his business. Calls to the military police and no one responded to us. Finally, on July 4th, someone took our call seriously and went to check his room. We were still calling and now we're really getting the runaround. They know something they say, but they can't tell us until the Army officially notifies his wife. Well, thank God a worker at the Malone House finally had enough compassion to tell my wife on the night of the 4th of July that James had passed away. The next day, my daughter-in-law was notified of Jimmy's death at approximately 0630 and we were notified around 9 a.m. Now the story gets in interesting. Our casualty officer was not informed of the cause of death, and we were not being told the cause of death either. We would not learn of it until after Jimmy had been buried. That's not quite true. We learned about it the day before we buried Jimmy. No matter what we did, we were met by a stone wall. One bureaucrat or officer after another would either say they did not know or would pass us to someone else who in turn would pass us on to another person. No one it seemed knew or were willing to tell us the actual cause of our son's death. We are to this day still unsure of his actual date of death. James' body was returned to us on July 13, 2003 and was buried on July 15, 2003. During the visit visitation on Monday, July 14th, the funeral home received a call from a retired, retired colonel in the area saying that he had knowledge of how my son had died and he was on his way to the funeral home to inform the family. Our casualty officer, who still had not seen a death certificate, got a copy of the death certificate faxed to him and he had the unfortunate task of taking me outside, telling me how my son died I then had to gather my family into a room and tell them how James died. We, Carol and I, are here today to relate our experience to you in hopes that some other soldier who's having problems won't be ignored, that he or she will be given the best care and treatment available. This is a great country. It's the greatest asset is our men and women in uniform. They deserve and we expect 
that they would receive the absolute best medical care this country can provide to its service people, to whom those parents have entrusted their children, and to whom this country turns to for protecting us and our country's values in times of need. Don't sweep these people under the rug. Out of sight, out of mind, not my problem. That's just not acceptable. They deserve so very much more. We, the parents who entrust our children to you, deserve more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Coons. Mrs. Coons, did you want to add anything, or was your husband speaking for both of you? Okay, thank you. Ms. Lacan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members here today. Uh, my name is Tammy Lecomte, the proud wife of soldier member specialist Ryan Lecomte from the Lower Bruce Sioux Tribe out of South Dakota. Ryan has been in the Army for seven years and has served two full tours in Iraq. He had plans for a full military career and wanted to serve 20 years. Even though that seems impossible now, Ryan has many proud memories while serving this nation. But today, he only feels shame and embarrassment, mostly because Ryan's leaders did not understand his war injuries, and that is part of what has led my being here today. Ryan willingly put his life on the line for all of us, and the only thing that we ask in return is understanding of his war-related conditions. No harassment from leaders who don't understand PTSD, proper and tailored mental health care, proper tracking, screening, and diagnose of traumatic brain injury. And finally, an appropriate discharge from the military if his condition does not improve. In 2004, after Ryan returned home from his first tour from Iraq, he filled out his post-deployment health assessment form and indicated that he was having difficulties readjusting. He did not receive a referral to mental health. Then again in 2005, he filled out a pre-deployment health assessment form and asked for a referral to mental health. He did not receive this referral and was instead redeployed to Iraq in June of 2005. These unfortunate circumstances have impact, impacted my family tremendously. When Ryan returned from his second tour in Iraq, he was a changed man. He again filled out his post-deployment health assessment form and again indicated that he was having difficulty readjusting. After Ryan's mandatory 90-day follow-up, he received an emergency referral to mental health. However, nobody followed up with him. Ryan needed help and could not get it. This period of time was very difficult for me and my family. The changes in Ryan were apparent, and I wanted to do everything I could to get him the help that he needed. In August of 06, Ryan unfortunately received a DUI and was referred to the Army Substance Abuse Program. During this period, Ryan was never diagnosed with PTSD, regardless of his repeated request for help. Finally, on March 22, 2007, Ryan was diagnosed with cro chronic post-traumatic stress disorder. Ryan's command claims that they were not notified of this diagnosis until just May 18, 2007. In April 2007, the abuse that Ryan received from his command worsened his condition to the point that his civilian mental health care provider referred him to Cedar Springs for a 72-hour acute care facility. At this point, I was completely discouraged. I am not a PTSD expert, but let me tell you how PTSD and the lack of care impacted my family. As a wife, it was hard to make sense of these changes with Ryan. I didn't understand the anger and the sudden outburst. I didn't understand the lack of support from his chain of command, and I couldn't explain to my children why Daddy was the way he was, detached, distant, and someone that I didn't know at all. My children were afraid. They were constantly asking why Ryan was acting the way he was, why he was yelling at me, or why was he always going away. It has even gotten to the point where my four-year-old daughter, Savannah, has made up songs about her daddy being gone. She doesn't understand, I don't understand, and Ryan's leaders don't understand. I was desperate and I was exhausted. These two binders on the desk represent the effort that I have made on behalf of my husband. Finally, when I contacted Veterans for America, they were able to reach out to Congress 
the mental health care providers at Evans Army Community Hospital and the civilian clinicians at Cedar Springs who indicated that Ryan needed to be in a more comprehensive, individually tailored inpatient facility. Because of VFA's pressure, the waiting time to get Ryan into an appropriate dual track PTSD substance abuse program with the VA went from four weeks to three days. Finally, Ryan is in an, is in an intensive program. However, he's living with patients primarily from the Vietnam War era. DOD must create similar programs for the soldiers from our newest wars. I am encouraged to hear from the vet Veterans for America that Major General Hammond has recognized that mistakes have been made at Fort Carson and that major changes within the Army as a whole are required. I also commend Brigadier General Tucker, who has been tasked by the Army to be the bureaucracy buster, that he has made a commitment to make the four following changes. That the Army records TBI and TB light TBI-like events in the soldier's medical record immediately after the event and that we screen for these events in the post-deployment health assessment and reassessment. That the Army institutes a leader teach program designed to teach Army leaders at all levels about TBI and PTSD so that they know how to identify symptoms in their soldiers, refer them to the appropriate care and know how to lead and take care of these soldiers that the Army develops a method that improves the commander's awareness of the soldiers in his or her unit with TBI and PTSD so that he can ensure the soldiers diagnosed with these conditions are appropriately taken care of. Institute a requirement that the medical facility review the physical exams of all soldiers undergoing administrative separation proceedings to ensure that no medical condition requiring a medical evaluation board is overlooked. I am encouraged when I hear leaders in the Army make these statements because it means that another family won't have to suffer the way our family has suffered in understanding these illnesses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. LeCombe. Before we uh, st uh, start asking questions, I think the students were going to leave, and so I thought I would just give them the okay. signal this is a good time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that great testimony. Well, I thank you, uh, each and every one of you, for very important and powerful testimony that you've given us from your own experiences, from your family's experiences, what uh, these illnesses uh, have meant. And um, oftentimes, post uh, traumatic stress disorders and other mental problems are completely invisible. People may not even realize it. What's, what's happening to them, and the system that's supposed to take care of them may not realize what's going on, or they may not be equipped to deal with it. Mr. and Mrs. Coons, uh, your son was certainly a remarkable man. He, uh, he would have been doing today what you're doing. Stand, he always stood up and fought for his men, and, and you're doing the same thing, because it's not just your son, it's a lot of other people's sons, husbands, fathers that uh, experience what's going on. Uh, and I know he would be very pleased that, and proud of the fact that you're carrying that message to us today. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, Specialist uh, Bloodworth, it sounds like you're getting the care you need. Do you, do you feel that um, it's being re you're being responded to and getting help that you need? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. Um, at first, no. At, at first, uh, I really felt the system was kind of uh, lax. Um, but once they determined what the problem was, um, they've been doing a good job. It was getting to the point and getting to the determination of what the issue was, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. um, Specialist Smith, your experience has, has been very different. Uh, you were. You were not diagnosed, or you, when you were diagnosed, they still wanted to send you back to, uh, was it Iraq or Afghanistan? Uh, it was back to Iraq, Mr. Chairman. Back to Iraq. And you tried to tell the, um, the military that you weren't ready to go back. Could you, could you tell us more about that, what happened with you there? 
Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had made several attempts taking letters of concern from my psychologist to my chain of command, um, even as far as my psychologist contacting my company commander personally and saying, this guy's not ready. He typed up a memorandum, um, you know, stating that I should not be allowed to be around weapons um, and that he just needed more time to work with me and he believed that I would be ready to go again. And um, according to what I was told, um, uh, they were not willing to give me that time to get better. So um, following his recommendations and what we thought was best for me, I went into inpatient care mm -hmm. so that I could start receiving medications and getting the proper treatment. So the system was, the medical system was helping you, but then the rest of the military system didn't seem to care what the medical system was doing. They wanted to send you back to Iraq even though you weren't ready to go back. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Let me ask, uh, both specialists, um, a lot of men don't know what's happening to them. They know they're just not sleeping well. They're experiencing all the symptoms you've described. And they may not understand what's happening. But is there a stigma that some of the men feel about even going and asking for help? Is this, is this one of the problems we're seeing? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Even when I began seeking treatment, I kept it separate from the military. Um, I went through Army One Source and started seeing a psychologist off post because I didn't really want anybody at work to know what was going on with me. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bloodworth? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, actually, when I was in country, uh, we had um, a group there, the combat stress team at Camp Anaconda, and um, they had initially done a briefing with every company and squadron that was uh, coming in and said, uh, we're here for you. Um, if, if you have any issues, uh, come talk to us. And immediately after those uh, doctors and specialists had left, uh, you got the feeling that people were snickering. People were like, you, you know, people don't need to go see them. Um, it, it is definitely a stigma, and especially in country, because it deters from the mission and it deters from uh, uh, your mission. Hmm. As I understand it, the way the uh, Army finds out is, is that putting out a questionnaire. Uh, can you tell us, anybody on the panel, about those questionnaires and whether that really gets to the um, issue? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yeah. filled out one of those surveys um, during mid-deployment because a uh, combat stress team decided it was necessary to do that on our post. Mm -hmm. um, very few questions. I think it was at least ten questions. Do you feel like you are a threat to yourself and others? Do you, do you feel like um, you want to hurt anyone? Um, questions like that, and you, and you filled it out with your squad, um, and then your squad leader would read it, and then he would send that to, bl to the platoon sergeant. And so it's, it's back to that stigma again. Mm -hmm. You don't want to let anybody know there's a problem. Well, I could see that stigma and the reluctance, but then the question is, what, do the, what does the Army do once you tell them you're having these problems? And um, the Defense Department convened a mental health task force that studied the way the armed forces are dealing with this uh, PTSD and other mental health matters, and that task force put out a draft with its findings, and it concluded, quote, the current efforts fall significantly short in treating mental health problems, and the military system does not have enough resources or fully trained people to fulfill its broad mission of supporting psychological health, end quote. So, in effect, they concluded our system is in crisis and that soldiers who are suffering from PTSD and other mental health problems are not getting the care they need. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Coons or Ms. LeCount, you certainly didn't find the system receptive and able to deal with the problems your son was having. Do you no, sir, Mr. Chairman, they didn't. We do have some. Uh, documents that James did complete prior to being area backed mm -hmm. out and asking him these type questions. Uh, how would you say your health is? Do you have any medical or dental problems? Are you currently profiled for light duty? Have you sought or tend to seek counseling for care of your mental health? I mean, he answered these and it was submitted. Back page. He said he had food poisoning, which is, I think, part of our issue is when this originally happened with James, the, the stigma with him being a soldier, being a career soldier, 
He felt like he let people down. He felt like his career was going to be in jeopardy now with Sergeant Major Academy coming up. And his, some of his peers said, well, we can log this as food poisoning and our heat stress. Hmm. And um, so when he's filling out his forms, I mean, that's what he's putting down on them. And the system just failed them completely. Well, this was back in 2003 also, Mr. So Chairman. Maybe we know more. Maybe the system knows more to respond. I, I hope, hope so. I hope so. Mr. LeConte, what, tell us what your thoughts are about how the system has been working for you and your family. Well, in that situation on like what the questionnaires that we were, they were discussing, my husband's situation, he filled out his and he was flagged um, not to go over or back and receive immediate help and it was ignored. Um, if it says, you know, refer to mental health and they don't have the staff or, or whatever it might be to, to help these soldiers, I mean, it really doesn't do any good to fill out these questionnaires. Thank you. My time is up, and I want to recognize Mr. Davis. Um, thank you much. Uh, Mr. Uh, Special Bloodworth, let me ask you, how would you rate the quality of care you've been receiving at Walter Reed? Uh, have they made progress now in your treatments? I'm making progress, uh, sir. Actually, I'm slotted to go on the community health care organization back in my home state. Uh, within the next month, which means that uh, they don't feel that I will at, at any point need to be an inpatient um, and I can receive my care at home through civilians or the VA. Can, I don't know, that, uh, they, they have a rough idea on statistics, but could you guess a percentage that just don't come forward because of the stigma approached uh, to this? Is there talk in the barracks or guys saying, you know, something's wrong, but I'm just afraid to step forward? I mean, Either one of you have any feel for that, Special Smith? Or uh, yeah, yes, sir. Um, and overseas, you, you see it because people, people see combat or people just being separated from home, and you see everybody becoming depressed and everybody coping with it. But the ones who are having a hard time coping with it, um, you can see it that they want help, and then you have that stigma. And I would say it affects. I don't. I wouldn't know a percentage, but I would say it affects many people in a unit. Is there informal talk about it, but people just don't want to come forward? Yes. I mean, there's people been saying, I wish I had somebody to talk to. Yeah. You know, somebody who wasn't my squad leader, somebody who wasn't in the platoon, somebody that didn't see you every day. And it's seen as a sign of weakness, isn't it, if you're in the military to kind of come forward? Exactly. Special Smith? Um, I would definitely say so. Uh, we have, um, you, you can tell the people that are having the problems because ones that have come forward people will gather around them and talk to them more about it. Um, but I definitely believe there's a lot of people that are scared to come forward. Um, like I couldn't say a percentage either, but I believe there's a lot of people that are afraid it's going to hurt their career to step forward. Well, military is a macho culture. I mean, that's just part of, I went through, <laughs> you know, my active duty and OCS and everything else. And I, we understand it. And I mean, it's seen as a sign of weakness, isn't it? Yes, sir. Um, let me, um, how is the care you're receiving now? Uh, the care I'm receiving now is excellent, sir. Um, they're really taking care of me, making sure that I get everything that I need. Ms. LeCompte, um, what support networks are available now through the military or the VA to families and children of soldiers who are suffering from mental illness? Have you seen in? What was that first part again? What, uh, I mean, uh, what support networks are available through the military or the VA? Have you found any that are available for situations like yours? Uh, well, my husband's in Sheridan, Wyoming, uh, right now at a VA facility. Um, as far as the treatment there, I mean, it really doesn't... Talk about support groups for you. Oh, there are... Well, there's a support group through Evans Army Hospital. However, I mean, there's only certain time frames to attend. So it's there, but it's really not adequate to, to it's meet It's not your, beneficial, your kids. correct. Have you, um, they given you any type of education on your husband's illness? Have they sat down and talked to you about what's involved and what you can expect and what prognosis is? No, sir. Uh, how about resources available to your children to better understand their father's illness? The same thing, not? No, sir. As we all hear from witnesses, uh, and we're going to hear this in our second panel, untreated emotional trauma arising from combat situations 
leads to a host of other problems, including depression, suicidal thoughts, substance abuse. When was your husband officially diagnosed uh, with post-traumatic stress disorder? As far as Evans, uh, in March of 07 is when they finally put it on paper. They would call it everything else but what it is. And during the time that he was deployed, there was nothing? Nothing. No diagnosis or anything else? Was he afraid to come forward, do you think, and, and admit that he, he was having some issues? I knew that, in a way, yes, I would say he was afraid to come forward. Um, but he would still try to seek help, you know, to get some help for this. But, you know, when he comes forward, a lot of the members of the chain of command, you know, they ridicule these soldiers and just not do what they should to make sure these soldiers are taken care of. Thank you. Uh, Mr. and Ms. Coons, I just want to thank you for sharing uh, your son's story with us. Um, you don't know how many times this is repeated across and people are afraid to come forward sometimes and talk about it in a, in a public setting and I know it's, it, it's not easy to do. And uh, I hope that we can honor uh, your son's life by acting on this, understanding it better and trying to ensure that it doesn't happen again and, and take steps. So I just want to thank you. I think the story speaks for itself. Um, and I, we just appreciate you coming forward. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, to all of our witnesses, I thank you all for being here. Uh, to Mr. and Mrs. Coons, Mr. Coons, you said that um, your son and others and matters of this nature should not be swept under the rug. And I promise you that we will do everything in our power to make sure that that does not happen. And we thank you for, for being here. We also thank Specialist Smith and Specialist Bloodsworth and Ms. LeCompte for your testimony. To Specialist Smith and Bloodsworth, um, as I was listening to the questions um, about stigma, I said to myself, um, this must not be the easiest thing to do. You're going to probably be on national television with this testimony. And that says a lot for you. But back to Mr. and Mrs. Coons and to all of you, I believe that one of the reasons why Specialist Smith and Specialist Bloodsworth are getting the kind of treatment that they're now getting is because of people like you who stood up and said that there were problems earlier and now we're seeing better treatment. Um, Specialist Smith, we, we've been told that soldiers with injuries, both mental and physical, are being sent back to fight in Iraq against their doctor's orders, and you testified to that. And just to follow up on the chairman's questions, in fact, back in March, you had recently returned from traveling with your unit to the National Training Center uh, in Fort Irwin, California, to participate in a pre-deployment training exercise. During that time, you were at, training, at the training center. I'm told that you experienced a disturbing incident during which you attacked a fellow soldier. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Um, I'd been having really bad nightmares and stuff, reactions to the uh, mortars that they were setting off in the distance. And it just so happened about 2 a.m. one night, a uh, fellow soldier came walking in the tent, and my bunk was right next to the tent, and it was right around the same time that was happening. And uh, I jumped up and grabbed him and slammed him up next to the tent. And uh, I mean, it was it was a pretty scary incident because if I'd have had a weapon or something, who's to say that I would not have actually hurt this guy? So this was just in March. This uh, was in March. In uh, January, sir. Okay. Uh, was that part of the reason that you and your doctors did not think think that you should return to Iraq? Uh, yes, sir. Um, upon returning from that, I immediately saw my all post psychologist, and that's when she said that I needed to seek more help and get medications, and that's when she referred me to On Post, mm -hmm. and that's when the psychologist On Post had made the recommendation that I not be deployed and not have weapons. And did you share your doctor's letters with your unit commanders? Yes, sir, I did. Uh, my unit commander was even contacted by the psychologist, and he had actually sat down and talked to my unit commander and gave him a copy personally. Now, do you have any idea why your commander would have wanted to deploy you even though your doctors felt that you were not fit for deployment. I mean, um, did you? 
Go ahead. My uh, company commander actually went to the colonel. I don't know which colonel. I don't know if it was the uh, squadron colonel or if it was the brigade colonel, but he told me that he went to the colonel with those letters. He was actually fighting for me not to go. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us, uh, based on your doctor's instructions, uh, what did you do to avoid being deployed to Iraq for a third time under the conditions that you just described? Uh, I, whenever I went in and sat down with my doctor, um, we discussed some things, and I had told him that I would rather um, I would rather kill myself than to see and experience the things that I had been through um, when I was over there last time. You know, I was not mentally healed and not prepared to go through this kind of thing again. And you and you knew that. Yes, sir. Do you still feel that way? Uh, no, sir. Um, the treatment that I'm getting now. Um, and with the medications and everything, it's really helping. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a lot better now. Well, we're glad that you're better. Do, those, do, other, do you think other soldiers go through the same extreme measures, uh, or did any of them just return and fight injured? I mean, do you know of situations? Uh, yes, sir. I know of um, several other people that were also going through the same procedures as me, and I also know of several others that were actually deployed. Um, and uh, there's actually some that have been sent back. They were deployed over there and then sent back because of uh, this investigation. Are these soldiers, do you think, do you think they are able to perform their duties? I mean, based upon what you know, I know you're not a doctor. Um, do they put themselves and other soldiers at risk, you think? In, in my opinion, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, nobody wants anybody with a mental condition or a physical condition trying to fight the front lines with them. Well, again, did you want to say something special about the Lord? Uh, no, no, sir. Well, again, I want to thank you all for your testimony, and hopefully we'll be able to use this testimony to, to help others. And, and I thank you. Thank you all so much. You're right, Mr. Coons. This is a great country, and uh, we're going to do our best to make it an even greater country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Uh, Mr. Issa, you want to yield your time? Sure. Just one minute. I yield one minute to the gentleman. I thank the gentleman. I just want to uh, thank my constituents, the Coons, for coming forward with your story. It takes enormous uh, bravery and courage to do what you have done. Um, it's uh, unconscionable to me how someone who is on suicide watch could be put in an outpatient facility at uh, Walter Reed. I, I'm, I'm glad that because of what happened that the Army has changed that policy. Um, and because you've come forward, you have changed some of the policies of, of the Army on this issue. Um, unfortunately, the Army has not apologized to you for your tragic experience, and I would like to, on behalf of the United States government, make that apology uh, to you and say that we're sorry. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I, I think I'd like to pick up uh, exactly uh, where the gentleman left off and say, we make mistakes. We've made mistakes in every war. And when we make mistakes, people die. And so you have my heartfelt uh, apology for the mistakes that clearly were made in your son's case. You didn't say what the death certificate said for your son. I would hope that it said service-connected death. That in fact, just like the men and women who were added to the wall of the Vietnam Memorial because they died of injuries received in Vietnam, your son clearly uh, is a fatality of his service. And you have our deepest sympathy. And all, all we can say is we will strive not to make this mistake again. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that we're not going to make mistakes and that young men and women aren't going to die again, or that bureaucracy isn't going to make a mistake. Our next panel is going to, in fact, represent healthcare professionals who we're going to count on to be part of that change. We're going to ask them if they have the resources they need, if, in fact, the attitude necessary to ensure that every man and woman gets the care they need and gets it in an uh, expeditious fashion exists both in the medical professionals and in the chain of command. <clears throat> We're going to ask if the organization needs to be changed, because that's what this committee does, is it oversees the bureaucracy and the structure of government. And last but not least, we're going to question the leadership at all levels, not just at Walter Reed, but 
throughout the military structure to find out whether or not leadership has, in fact, gotten the message that not all, not all injuries can be seen from the outside. I'm, uh, it's very hard to ask questions uh, in this kind of an environment because each of you it represents somebody who's fallen through the cracks of our system. And, uh, you know, finding the right changes can be difficult. Uh, Special Smith, I, I do have a, a couple of questions for you. Uh, if I understand correctly, your, uh, your back injury occurred early on before your first deployment. Yes, sir. And that still bothers you today. Yes, sir. And are you receiving uh, physical therapy and other treatment to help with that? Uh, I did physical therapy for approximately six months, and they told me that I'd reached the uh, extent of my physical therapy. And have um, they diagnosed what the permanent uh, portion of the disability is? Uh, yes, I have a uh, diffused bulge disc in uh, between my L4, L5 vertebrae. And surgery won't do any more for it? Uh, no, sir. They said surgery could possibly make it worse. Okay, and you said you have a P3, so you have a limited uh, ability to perform your duties. Is that right? Yes, sir. What are those limitations? Um, hold on. I got it right here, sir. Uh, According to this profile, I cannot carry or fire an individual weapon. I'm not able to move with fighting gear at least two miles. I'm not able to construct an individual fighting position. I'm not able to do three to five second rushes under direct or indirect fire. Um, I Specialist, I think I've got it. You're not, <laughs> you're not fit for combat. Yes, sir. Uh, and yet you were deployed. Uh, now, I guess I'll ask the tough question. Have you ever been offered a discharge under medical conditions as a result of that injury? Uh, no, sir. Um, the only medical board that I'm getting is for my uh, psychiatric care. Do you think that you should have been offered or should the military have evaluated if you couldn't do the job? Uh, I'll tell you that the honest to goodness truth, I enlisted in the Army in 1970 to be a truck driver. So uh, <clears throat> I ended up in bomb disposal because I wasn't good enough to be a truck driver, I suspect. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I, in fact, understand what it's like bouncing around in a military vehicle. Do you think that, in fact, that should have been the first sign that, in fact, you were going to have difficulty performing in your multiple tours to Iraq? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. I, if there's a second round, I'd love to pick up on this, and I thank the chairman. You'll thank back. you very much, Mr. Ice. Uh, Ms. Watson. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to say to all of our witnesses that we appreciate your valor, your courage, and your bravery for coming here in front of this committee. It takes a lot of courage uh, to tell the truth. And it's time now that uh, we have people like yourselves come and tell the truth. In the middle of this war that we're fighting, the casualties are a manifestation of the cracks in our system. And you're coming and you're articulating for us what the cracks in our system are. If we're going to protect our homeland, we have to know where to fix these cracks along the way so that we can indeed protect the land that we love, we're committed to. And I just want to thank you for being here. Uh, one of the purposes of the hearing is to help people understand the conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury. Uh, these are very serious injuries, even though they are invisible. They are injuries caused by real, real traumatic battlefield experiences. Now, a number of studies have shown that the mere time soldiers spend in combat, the more likely they are to develop PTSD when they come home. The soldiers most likely to develop these conditions are the soldiers who spend most time outside the wire, where they are exposed to sniper and mortifier and IEDs. I'd like to direct this to Specialist Smith and Bloodworth. You both have uh, had combat experience, 
And uh, I'd like to ask each one of you to describe what soldiers experience when they're in Iraq. So Specialist Smith and Bloodworth, can you give us some description of your experiences for our committee? Uh, let's start with Specialist Smith, please. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, whenever we were in Ramadi, we were under constant fire. Uh, every day we left the wire. Um, every day we were mortared. We seen RPGs, sniper fire on a constant basis. Um, I was hit with six IEDs, and, or the vehicle that I was in was hit with at least six IEDs. Um, sniper fire, like I said, on a, on a regular basis. Um, and it's, it's really stressful. Um, we've seen people blown apart. We've seen our own soldiers um, catch fire and burn right in front of us. Um, these are all things that pretty much everybody in my whole company experienced. Sergeant Flatford. Uh, Ma'am, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. Um, I was running convoys, uh, five on, one off. Um, that was that was our routine, um, and and with that, I've seen friends and fellow soldiers injured, um, killed. You know, y your friends will go out on mission, and then somebody doesn't come back. Uh, I was hit with five IEDs and so many small arms ambushes. Yeah, I can't even count. Uh, in 11 and a half months that I was there. Um, it's a very nerve-wracking experience, even on your off time, on the, on the day that you're supposed to be able to rest. Um, you can't get the other five days that you just spent out on the road out of your head. Um, I'm looking at you in uniform, and uh, I know that your training, at least traditionally, has been to fight in a conventional way, correct? Yes, ma'am. What you're finding in Iraq is a non-conventional kind of uh, experience. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Does your enemies wear uniforms similar to what you have on? They better not. <laughs> <laughs> similar. Make our I job said. easier. They don't have patches indicating what countries they're from? Uh, no, ma'am. Most of the time they're dressed as civilians and they'll even just pop out of a crowd of people and just fire at you. So you never know who the enemy is? Yes, ma'am. Right. And uh, were you trained to deal with IEDs? Uh, we had some brief training uh, before we left. They went through some obstacle courses and, you know, told us what we can expect, but the IEDs are constantly changing. Um, just in the time we were over there, they went through like two different kinds that they were using. They started out with, you know, pressure plates, and they were using them where they were putting them up on the telephone poles. Um, so that it's constantly training, so it, it, or changing, so it's hard to keep up with the training. But when the other panel comes uh, up, uh, I want to know how we are training and preparing our troops to fight in an unconventional manner. And I think if we can get to that point, maybe we can start addressing uh, the results of the experiences that uh, you have uh, experienced. And uh, I want to say to the Coons, and I want Ms. to- Ms. Watson, your, your time is up. Would you just uh, conclude your sentence because- uh, Okay, yeah. uh, and they can respond maybe at another time, but I just want to say that uh, until we can get to the point that we will understand what we're up against we're going to see more cases like you're describing. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank Chairman. I thank you, Ms. Watson. Uh, Mr. Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank the panel for your testimony and for your sacrifices. Um, particular welcome to Specialist Bloodworth, a fellow Kentuckian. Welcome. It's nice to see you. Um, I think it's safe to say, uh, I think I can speak for everyone on this panel and probably everyone in Congress that one of the toughest things we deal with is trying to suppress our own emotions when we hear stories like yours. It's a combination of anger and sympathy, uh, sympathy for your, the cost that, that um, you have experienced, and, but anger that um, the system is not handling your needs as well as it could. I'd like to kind of proceed on 
somewhat of a corollary from what uh, Congresswoman Watson was asking. Did any of you know what PTSD was before you got in the service? Uh, so they'd given us some briefings about depression and anxiety, and they gave it a face and called it PTSD, but didn't really explain what it was. Do we, is there any way that you can prepare psychologically for what you experienced and what you saw? Um, take it one day at a time is the best thing to do. Specialist Smith. Um, I always say that you can, you can prepare for it, but you can never be ready for it. Do you, do you think there was um, that the preparation that you received as to the possible psychological impact of what you were going to experience could have been better? Or do you, do you think there's any way to make it better? Um, I, don't, I don't think there's any way to really make it better because you, you don't know what you're going to see. Um, all you can do is maybe watch videos and have it explained to you what you might be experiencing. But um, I don't think there's any way to really prepare for it. Addre addressing the question of the stigma that um, we, has been talked about by several of the members and you've addressed, do you think that it would be beneficial if everyone who came out of a combat zone, as you did, were forced to do more than answer a questionnaire so that there would, there would be no question of you wimping out and seeking treatment? Uh, yes, sir. I think it would be very beneficial for anywhere from three to six months for them to be forced to sit down and talk with somebody and uh, talk about their experiences. Uh, that way they can be evaluated one-on-one. -on -one. Nobody has to know who said what. Specialist Bloodworth, would you agree with that? I agree, but that would definitely work for the active army, but for the National Guard, I don't mm -hmm. see how. I mean, it is a good idea, but... Um, maybe a, a possibly longer demobilization time and uh, retraining soldiers to live daily life and um, doing more than just a 10 question questionnaire. Mm -hmm. Mr. Coons, you, you were shaking your head. Uh, uh, did that indicate that you had a different response? Well, through our congressman's office, we've been trying to get some questions answered. And just yesterday, we were given a letter from the acting secretary of the Army, and they bring up that subject that uh, in addition, a post-deployment health reassessment is given three to six months following a soldier's return from deployment. I, as a citizen, and have lost a son, find that deplorable. Some of these young people are going over there for their second and third tours. Why do we have to wait three to six months? It's normally too late. It should be one of the first things these people go through when they return. I'm no doctor, but I mean, it's... I just can't understand that. Mrs. LeCompte, do you have a comment on this issue as to whether mandatory um, screening following returning would have been helpful in your case? Yes, I do. I, I feel that it should have been done right away. Thank you. One further question of Specialist Smith. You talked about the fact that when you were redeployed that you were uh, possibly a threat to others and, and um, that you, that, that is certainly a problem. Could you explain to maybe in what other ways you, your performance as a soldier changed, if it did, between deployments? Uh, yes, sir. Um, I lost a lot of initiative. Um, I really didn't care to advance in the military anymore. Especially, I mean, I felt like I was getting looked down upon. Um, I just, I, I started showing up to work late, where I was always, you know, one of the first ones there. And, um, I just really didn't care to train anymore. I was just kind of out of it most of the time when I was there. Finally, I, I guess a quick question for um, both you specialists. Did you, do you feel that you had to put any pressure on uh, the system to get the attention that, that you needed? Uh, yes, sir. Um, actually, whenever I was put into inpatient care, my mother had contacted um, a news reporter and that's whenever all my care and uh, all this got started for me. Thank you, Mr. Yarmouth. Thank uh, you. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a, a few questions. Uh, I'd like to ask a few questions related to uh, the stress that multiple deployments and an increased duration of employments may be having on our armed forces. 
Um, we already know uh, through studies that uh, the rate of PTSD amongst soldiers returning from a second deployment is uh, about 40% um, higher than it is uh, for those returning from their second deployment. But uh, I had the chance to visit uh, our soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan in April, and I just happened to be there on the day that uh, the Department of Defense announced that they would be extending the tours of duty from 12 months to 15 months for those soldiers. This is the first time in our military history when we've had uh, a policy whereby soldiers are asked to serve on the front lines, as Specialist Smith has testified to, uh, five days, six days, seven days uh, without time off. Um, that goes beyond six or seven months. Um, now we're having 12-month deployments extended to 15-month deployments. Um, and I direct the question to Specialist Bloodworth at first, because I believe that uh, the unit that you served with in Iraq, the 34th Infantry Division, from uh, 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 was extended, I think, recently by 125 days. Is that correct? Yes, sir. We received our extension orders in uh, Jan the 1st of January of 07. Can you just talk for a moment how soldiers in the unit uh, reacted to this, uh, to the extension, and, and to what extent that uh, uh, that affects the morale uh, of the of the unit? Metaphorically, you could have heard everybody's hearts breaking when the first sergeant handed us out our orders. Um, that was the time when when people really started to lose their cool, really started to lose their military bearing, and uh, became complacent even on mission because. Who cares? We're here for another 125 days. Um, we were actually in the process of packing, uh, packing our connexes and sending bags home, and uh, they just dropped the bomb on us. And and, and I would imagine, specialists, that for those troops who have had mental illness or PTSD that's gone undiagnosed, that 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 that, that moment can be uh, especially backbreaking. It, it worsened for for a lot of people, and and uh, I I was working with the. Um, combat stress team, I was going and seeing them offline without my unit even knowing. Only one person in my unit knew. And uh, you know, they actually found out we were getting extended and I had an email to come see them immediately to talk about the issues because my therapist there thought there would be an issue. Special Smith, if I might ask that question to, to you as well, your thoughts on how these announcements related to tour extensions have had an effect on both troop morale and on uh, troops who may have uh, undiagnosed or untreated PTSD and mental health uh, issues. Uh, I agree with the specialist here that I mean it's, it's really heartbreaking um, to tell somebody that you're going to not see your family for another three months, especially when the, like the R and R leave. Like I got buddies that you know we just deployed March, they're already coming home on R and R, and they got another 12 months they have to spend in country before they can see their family again. I believe that it plays a big role on it. Uh, and, and I'll actually uh, turn that question also over to Ms. Le LeCompte because this is uh, an issue that relates not only to the soldiers um, that may have their conditions exacerbated by an extension on their tour, but it also affects their support uh, 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 network, um, uh, those expecting them to come home after 12 months realizing that that's extended. It might just give you the opportunity to talk about how uh, that affects families that you may know or be in contact with. It would definitely... Um you know, cause more stress to the family. I mean, of course, you know, every day just sitting and waiting just to hear for a phone call just to make sure they're okay and for them to extend it even more, you know, and still yet don't have a clue on how to fix what's happening to these soldiers is it's very detrimental. It's like an epidemic. Thank you very much. I know there are those on this panel who might want to separate uh, the issue of the policies directed to towards the wars we're fighting now with the question uh, of how we treat and how we prevent these uh, illnesses uh, from uh, for, from becoming exacerbated. I think this is an example in which the two can cannot be separated, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Welch? Thank you. It Taking off from where my colleague, Mr. Murphy, spoke, he, I was with him on the trip uh, to Iraq and Afghanistan. It was the first time in my life where I spent five days with the soldiers in their world. And uh, I came away with enormous respect. Uh, and a lot of the respect was that what is being asked of you is really quite unbelievable. You are in danger constantly. And uh, we've heard the 
testimony about the stress you've been under, uh, the, the change in your son and the tone of the letters that came back. Uh, and uh, I don't know what you think of this, but as I, as I listen to this, uh, there's issues about the Army uh, in, the, in our services being responsive. And you're helping us focus on paying whatever attention we can to that so it's better. Uh, but there's also a, a situation there where you guys are just in incredible danger all the time. I mean, what you described, uh, how many IED uh, events that you were involved with, the sniper fire constantly, uh, I mean, that, that takes its toll. And then having news that when you thought your deployment was going to end, it's going to be extended. Uh, all the while, there's significant questions about whether what you're doing over there is a civil war and you're caught in the middle of it. Uh, it's, it's so incredibly stressful. Uh, I just want to convey to you my, my, uh, my appreciation for what you're doing. But I don't know anybody who could uh, manage to, uh, to, to serve a tour without a significant toll. Uh, i just like, maybe I'll ask you, uh, Sergeant uh, Specialist Bloodworth, to describe some of the additional day-to-day -day events that you experienced uh, during your service. All right. Either. Day to day experience was um, I was a driver for the longest time, so my truck commander felt that it was necessary for me to sleep all the time unless we were on the road. So, um, mission days, it was, you know, wake up, eat, get the truck ready, go on mission, try not to die, come back, go to sleep. And um, on off days, I usually just tried to hang out with some of my, my friends within our platoon and uh, take off the uniform, put on some PTs, and try and forget the fact that you're in Iraq. And uh, maybe barbecue, maybe grill, just <laughs> just talk, <laughs> go see a movie or, or something um, to try and escape that. That was day-to-day -day living um, off mission, because I think we've both described what on mission was like. Specialist Smith? Oh, my day-to-day -day living wasn't quite as comforting as his. We didn't have movie theaters or anything like that. Um, we actually lived in a house that was taken over in Ramadi. Um, we had people that lived around us, uh, so we were constantly having to be on watch. Um, we had a big gas station across the street from us where, you know, there was people constantly in and out. Um, so day-to-day -day living was really stressful even there. We were in close quarters. We had eight men to just a regular-sized bedroom, you know. Um, so it was really stressful, and uh, it was really hard to deal with people on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis living like that. I can imagine. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. Coons, you described the change in the tone of your letters. I mean, your son sounded like a wonderful young boy, a young man, and in, in, uh, in, in, uh, military person. And then you noticed a real stark uh, change in the, in the tone of the letters. And I'd be interested in uh, whether, I know you've given that a lot of thought, but do you have any uh, thoughts that you can share with us about what accounted for his change in tone. With, with James being a career soldier, and I mean, and really, I, I say that in the beginning that even as a youth, he always had the Army first, and he was over getting prepared for the initial invasion and everything, and I guess if, if, you, if people can go back to 2003, it seems like we geared up, we were getting ready to go, then we came back down. This happened two or three times. And um, he, we would talk about that in emails, and he said, just it's frustrating people. We're ready to go, let's go, let's get it over with. Uh, I would say in April or May, he has never said anything negative about his military career. But some reason in April or May, he become disillusioned. He said, all I care about now is my 20 years and I'm getting out. Where all we had heard in the past is I will probably be here 25 or 30 years. I want to be Sergeant Major of whatever division. That was his goal. And it, it, his whole attitude started changing in about that time frame. Uh, I can't put m my finger on it. I mean, comments we'd see, it's a numbers game. Uh, we're not respecting our deceased soldiers. I mean, just things like that from him on a constant basis. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Welch. I yield my time. Mr. Hodes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I also want to thank all the witnesses for being here today. This is very important testimony. If we are going to make 
um, the right kinds of changes to make sure that the things that happened to your husband, your son, and you, the soldiers, um, are fixed. We really need to hear from you, so I appreciate your being here today. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I'd like to talk about is what the Army calls dwell time. It's the uh, amount of time sp soldiers spend at home uh, between deployments. Now, the Army policy has been that the ratio between dwell time and deployment time should be two to one. For example, for every year you spend deployed in Iraq, you should spend two years at your home bases. And during those two years, soldiers have time to retrain, to recuperate, to spend time with their families that were interrupted by deployment. Uh, the Army has recently had to change that policy. Um, for Iraq and Afghanistan, according to one recent study, there are currently 14 brigade units in Iraq that are deployed with less than two years at home, and four brigades that have deployed with less than one year of dwell time. Um, now, we've also heard a report that the Army is even considering paying bonuses to soldiers who agree to spend less time at home between deployments. I want to explore a little bit the importance of dwell time and why the two-year policy is an important policy for soldiers and their families. Um, let me ask first uh, Specialist Smith, how much dwell time did your brigade unit, the 3rd Brigade, 3rd Infantry Division, have between its Iraq deployments? Uh, well, 3rd Brigade, they deployed in 2003, again in 2005, and now again in 2007. Um, were, there, were there times when it was uh, uh, less than two years at home? Every time, sir. And um, did you have discussions with your fellow soldiers about the dwell time issue and what it meant for you? Uh, yes, sir. Um, the time just passes so fast when you're back here in the States. Eight months goes by and you feel like you just got home and then you're gearing up to go again. Um, it's it's kind of depressing. So it adds to the stress of the redeployment to have not enough dwell time at home. Yes, sir. And if you had more dwell time, what do you think the effect would be uh, on the mental health of the soldiers who are returning for redeployment? Uh, I believe it would allow more time to um, get evaluated, uh, to, to get the things out of your mind, to, to be with the ones that you love, because um, that, that's, that's a big issue. You're not, by the time you get resituated and with your family, you're gearing up to leave again. So you can never really fully adjust back to the life of your family, you know, being with your family. Uh, Mrs. LeCompte, uh, from your standpoint as a family member, can you talk to us a little bit about what the dwell time means to you and having enough time to uh, be with uh, your husband during, before, in between deployments and uh, what impact, if any, having shrinking dwell time means for you and the family? Um, my husband was only home pro approximately about eight months before he went back out again, and I mean, it's... Um, definitely hard to adjust because it takes them so long to adjust, you know, just coming from a hostile environment to back to a home environment as it is. And um, it, I just think that, you know, the, the shorter it gets, the harder it would be on families because, I mean, it just takes them so long as we're here today, you know, things are just now coming out about the PTSD issues already and it would um, it, it you have a lot of problems home already you know just from them coming home uh, mr. And mrs. Coons do you have anything to add to the question of other dwell time no sir unfortunately we didn't have that experience okay, thank you very much uh, mr. chairman before I yield back I just want to say I think it's um, not right to treat our troops this way uh, we know our soldiers need more time at home to recuperate, preserve their health, uh, get ready for redeployment, and deal with what they've been through. Uh, but uh, in my judgment, we went into this war without the proper preparations. We've shortchanged our troops. We're denying them the rest they need to do their jobs and keep themselves safe. And it's multiplying the issues that we're now facing with mental health problems, PTSD, uh, that we're seeing. And uh, it's an issue that we are going to have to address. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield Would the back. gentleman yield? Certainly. Uh, I'd like to join the gentleman in recognizing that the dwell time is not enough 
and that with approximately one million soldiers, sailors, and Marines, uh, it's the inequity that many, many units have never been in theater in Afghanistan or Iraq, while others are on their third deployment. And I hope that this committee will uh, join the chairman uh, in trying to get to the bottom of why that inequity continues to exist. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hodes. Uh, I want to recognize Mr. Tierney, who is the subcommittee chairman, who has worked so uh, diligently on the issue of Walter Reed and has been very involved in all of the questions of what we are doing for our, our returning military. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having this hearing and thank all of you witnesses for uh, coming forward and helping us out with this, uh, this matter. I think it is going to make a significant difference. And I think to a certain extent, Mr. and Mrs. Coons, in an unfortunate way, you have already made a difference, as, as has your son. Um, I was curious, as you were testifying, I was looking through some of the records that we had produced uh, as a result of some of the earlier hearings on that. How long had your son actually been uh, separated from his family and in the theater before his death? Around a year. About a year? Mm -hmm. And had he, uh, and how long had he been home before he uh, was sent in for that year? I'm sorry? Had he been in before and come home and then was going in again, it was, was his first deployment? This was his first deployment. Yeah. Um, I note in the reports and the issues that I hear that the change of attitude that you may have experienced seemed to follow his exposure to a number of killings in action. It was followed by nightmares and things of that nature. And then his acute stress disorder was compounded by the lengthy separation from his family. I think these are all issues that we're going to have examined as we do more research into the matter on that. There's nothing in the reports, however, about your constant contacts with the, uh, with the hospital once your son got home or whatever. And I think we're going to explore that uh, as we go on in the hearings as to why uh, there isn't a recording on that and why there wasn't enough attention paid to your efforts to get in touch with him. But there was an indication in the records that there was apparent confusion uh, that existed when your son was sent home uh, through the medical system, through the medical channels, as an ambulatory patient as opposed to an inpatient. Uh, and that that is an indication here that there was a policy clarification they note here, but uh, that people ought to have an attendant with them and a supervisor with them when they come home in that sense. Uh, and there's an extensive paperwork here about reiterating that clarification, making sure that happens. So in that sense, at least, I want you to know that there's been a change made uh, in that, and I think it's going to make a significant difference in the, the lives of other people. I won't belabor this panel, Mr. Chairman. I think that the questioning has been pretty uh, extensive and the answers have been uh, very helpful. I just want to again thank all of you for your service to the country and, and uh, give our ser serious condolences for your loss to the Coons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Uh, Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank all of you for your testimony. It demonstrates a lot of courage to be here. Um, I'm struck by a couple things just at the outset. One is uh, looking at you and listening to you, I know that there are thousands of families and individuals and soldiers who are in a similar position. And that's what makes your testimony so powerful um, here today. I'm also very aware of the sheltered existence, the protected existence that I have, um, not having been in the situation you've been in. And I'm aware that it's sheltered and protected by you, by what you're doing. So I thank you for that. Um, Ms. LeCompte, I wanted to ask you a few questions based on your testimony um, about the impact um, that your husband's condition had on the family, uh, but in particular, the impact that the failure to get the help in a timely way that you were seeking had on your family. In other words, I can imagine that if there were regular appointments that had been established right from the beginning of his return, um, that that would have helped you get from one day to the next, because you knew that relief, that help was coming, right. and the fact that it didn't come or you expected it to be there and then it wasn't there only added to the stress and the tension inside the home. So if you could speak to that. Well, definitely. It. I mean, these guys go over to protect the United States and they expect to be protected when they come home. Um, it, I mean, the, the overall effect when you think there is help and there's not, I mean, it's very detrimental to 
the whole family, the children, I mean, it has its ripple effects. And, um, you know, when these guys go in and ask for help or they're going through the SRPs or, or whatever, they expect the help and when it's neglected, they only deteriorate more. Did you find yourself having to step into a kind of support role that you felt should have been provided by other resources? And what was the effect of that? I do. Think? I mean, I feel that my husband was ignored and, you know, ridiculed and so on. And so finally, I had to become his voice and kind of step in. And even myself, as, as the military calls it, being a civilian, um, it was even hard to get people to listen to me uh, for that help, for plea, and it shouldn't have gotten this far. Well, I salute you for not giving up and pushing on the system and beginning to get the results that you deserve right from the outset. Um, I'd like to ask you, Specialist Smith and Specialist Bloodworth, this uh, single question, and that is, um, and this, this is a follow-up to the questioning about the extension of tours. Um, describe, if you can, how much a soldier invests psychologically in the end date of their tour. In other words, right from the beginning. Because, because again, I don't know it from personal experience, but I got to believe that part of what allows you to steal yourself for what you're experiencing right from the first day is having that date when you know you're going to come home. And so the, the contribution to, to uh, post-traumatic stress disorder that comes from the experiences you're having on the ground is one thing. But is it compounded? I mean, does it actually have an effect on your mental state when suddenly, and, and I think you said, Specialist Bloodworth, that you were packing at one point when you got word of an extension, which represents sort of psychologically just pulling the rug. So talk about from the beginning of a tour, how important and how invested you get in, if it's the case, in that end date and what the effect of it is when it gets pulled away from you. Uh, sir, I'd say that uh, mentally you have a whole lot invested in that. Um, and that's, you're looking forward to it. And uh, even when I was there, I was told I was leaving on a certain date, and it was two weeks later. And for that two weeks, I was just, you know, like he said, I got complacent. I was like, all right, whatever, I'm just here. Um, you, you invest a whole lot into that time that they say this is when you're going home. And uh, just to finish up before time runs out, um, it's pretty much like seeing the, the light at the end of the tunnel and it turns out to be a freight train and you don't know what to do because that time seems to grow indefinitely and every day gets longer. So it's, it's difficult, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Chairman, it, it just strikes me that, that the policy itself is contributing to the, the mental state, the negative mental state that we're talking about here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, Mr. Issa? I'll be brief, but I, I think it's very important since we have you here to follow up on that line of questioning. Uh, and it's not related to the topic, but it is related to your service. Uh, were you aware while you were in Iraq that while you were serving, depending upon what time you were there, but let's just call it a one-year uh, tour, that units were, other units such as Navy, uh, not the corpsmen, but, but other than Navy corpsmen, we're serving four months or less, that the Air Force routinely serves 120 days. We, you were shaking your head, yes, specialist. You were aware of that. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the camp I was at was actually an Air Force base, so we saw a changing of hands constantly. Very jealous. So they basically came in, got their, uh, got their combat time, their tax-free pay, and they were gone pretty quick, never having gone outside the wire. Uh, the only people from the Air Force that I was aware of that were going outside the wire was their EOD elements. But as for everyone else, that's pretty much it, sir. Well, as an EOD guy, I, I appreciate that. Uh, last but not least, it's been announced that for Army and Marine units already at 12 months, they're going to 15 months. What do you think that's going to do uh, to the types of tours that you've already endured? 
Uh, I think it's going to make it mu much harder. Um, it's just so much. Three months doesn't sound like much, but when you're over there, it, it seems like a lifetime that you're away from your family. And, you know, that's just that's three months longer. You have to deal with the same person day in and day out. You wake up, you look at them, and, you know, it's, it, it makes it a lot harder. Um, and when they say extending, you know, and they have three months, to, to me, that's almost 60 more missions. That's almost 60 more days that I'm going to be out there strung out, stressed out. And um, it's, it's hard to look at things like that and still keep a cool head. Well, thank you for your service. Thank you for your testimony. And I yield back and thank the chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Issa. Let, let me again thank all of you for your presentation and your forthrightness in responding to questions and helping us understand what's happened in your cases and what's what uh, and realizing your your situations are magnified many times over by others who are experiencing the very same, very very nearly the same kinds of situations. We're going to have to learn as a country to. Uh, to deal with all of this a lot better than we have. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take a, uh, f a five minute recess before we call the s second panel. Stand in recess. The uh, committee will come back uh, to order. For our uh, second panel, I want to um, uh, welcome Dr. Michael Kilpatrick, the Deputy Director for Force Health Protection and Readiness Programs at the Department of Defense. Dr. Kilpatrick is accompanied by Dr. Jack Smith, the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Clinical and Program Policy. Dr. Antoinette Zeiss is Deputy uh, Chief Consultant in the Office of Mental Health Services at the Department of Veterans Affairs, Dr. Zeiss is accompanied by Dr. Al Botrus, the VA's uh, Chief Officer at, at the Office of Readjustment Counseling. Dr. Thomas Insel is the Director of the National Institute of Mental Health at the National Institutes of Health. Major General Gail S. Pollack is the Commander of the U.S. Army Medical Command and is the Army's Acting Surgeon General. And Dr. John Fairbank is an Associate Professor of Medical Psychology at the Duke University Medical Center and a member of the Institute of Medicine's Committee on Veterans Compensation for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. I want to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you were here for the first panel, it's the practice of our committee to ask all witnesses to uh, take a, a, an oath and those who may be speaking as well, who have accompanied those who are making the oral presentations, if you would also rise, we'd appreciate it. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will indicate that each of the uh, witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, and I uh, want to uh, uh, start with um, Dr. Kilpatrick, who, uh, if, if he would uh, be our first uh, witness. We have your prepared statements, and we will put those in the record in full, but we'd like to ask each of you, if you would, to limit the uh, oral presentation to uh, five minutes. We'll have a, a clock. It will turn yellow when you've got a minute left, and then, uh, and then red when five minutes is up. Dr. Kilpatrick. I'd like to start by expressing my appreciation for the opportunity to hear the uh, testimony of the first panel very compelling, uh, very courageous people, and I thank them also. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the department's 
for self-protection and readiness program and programs in the military health system with a focus on the mental health aspects of those programs. Two primary objectives of the military health system are to ensure a medically ready force and to provide world-class care for those who become ill or injured. The Department of Defense is well aware of the stress that combat deployments place on our service members and their families. We have a multitude of proactive programs in place and underway to educate, screen, diagnose, and treat our service members and their families. We also have robust surveillance programs in place to monitor the health of our force before, during, and after deployments. In theater, we have a smaller medical footprint that is agile, mobile, and responsive to the needs of the mission. This includes medical support for mental health in theater. Each branch of service has specific combat stress and deployment mental health support programs available before, during, and after the deployment cycle. These provide support tailored to the service's mission and risk factors their personnel might face. Multi-faith chaplains deploy with units to maintain ministry of presence. They offer confidential counseling and are safe havens for those who need someone to talk with during troubling times. They often facilitate access to other avenues of care. Since March 1st, 19th, rather, of 2003, there have been nearly 27,000 aeromedical transports out of Operation Iraqi Freedom Theater. 20% of those are for combat injuries, 20% have been due to non-combat injuries, and the remaining 60% are due to medical conditions that need evaluation or treatment not available in theater. Mental health conditions have accounted for 7% of those transports. We have over one million post-deployment health assessments done as people come out of theater from worldwide deployments. The active duty, 22% indicate medical concerns, 5% mental health concerns, and 18% are referred for further evaluation after discussing their issues and concerns with a provider. All referrals are fairly equally divided between medical only, mental health only, and medical and mental health. The reserves, 41% have medical concerns, 6% have mental health concerns, and 24% are referred. We have over 200,000 post-deployment health assessments done three to six months after people get home from these worldwide deployments. That started in June 2005. 33% of active duty have medical concerns on those assessments, 27% have mental health concerns, and 16% are referred for further medical evaluation. The reserve component, 56% have medical concerns, 42% have mental health concerns, and 51% are referred. An important element of the post-deployment health assessments is education of the service members about medical conditions, both physical and mental, and the signs and symptoms that indicate the need for further evaluation. To better understand the mental health needs of the deployed force, the Army sent its first mental health advisory team to theater in 2003. This was the first time that such an assessment was done during a wartime deployment to evaluate the adequacy of mental health support in theater and preparation of medical and support staff for mental health care. Deployment-related mental health research projects are being conducted across DOD, VA, HHS, and other federal and academic institutions. 32 of the 67 current projects are focused on PTSD. In 2004, a Hoag study showed a direct relationship between the level of combat exposure and meeting screening criteria for major depression, generalized anxiety, or PTSD. The proportion of people who met the screening criteria for each mental health disorder was higher after OIF Iraq than after OEF Afghanistan and was higher in the post-deployment groups than in the pre-deployment group. A review of post-deployment health assessment mental health data showed a positive mental health screening in 19% of people returning from OIF compared to 11% coming back from Afghanistan and 8% returning from other locations in the world. Mental health concerns were significantly related to combat experiences. Among some 69,000 veterans of, of Iraq who accessed mental health in the year after coming home, only 35% actually received a mental health diagnosis. The military health system is second to none in its ability to deliver timely quality mental health and behavioral care. This includes behavioral health and primary care, 
mental health specialty care, clinical practice guidelines, and ready access to high quality, occupationally relevant primary care, along with different modeling and demonstration projects that are designed to help us continue to learn and improve the system of care delivery. In addition, walk-in appointments are available in virtually all military mental health clinics around the world. The 2003 Millennium Cohort Study evaluates the long-term health effects of military service, specifically deployments. Almost 140,000 individuals have enrolled in this DODVA groundbreaking 22-year study. As force health protection continues to be a priority for the future of military medicine, the Millennium Cohort Study will provide crucial steps in understanding the long-term health effects. The Department of Defense is very concerned about the short and long-term health care. We look for ways to better serve our, our service members and we look forward to outside expert advice. The Mental Health Task Force, as you've discussed, is making recommendations and we are looking forward and committed to diligently working to incorporate their recommendations. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Kilpatrick. Dr. Zeiss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I'm pleased to be here today and to discuss the steps the Department of Veterans Affairs is taking to meet the mental health care needs of our nation's veterans. As you mentioned, I'm accompanied by Dr. Alfonso Batras, Director of Veterans Readjustment Counseling. I also was here for the entire first panel and agree with the power and importance of that information. Rehabilitation for war-related PTSD and other military-related readjustment problems, along with the treatment of the physical wounds of war, is central to VA's continuum of health care programs. Mental health services are provided in all VA medical facilities, including inpatient, outpatient, and substance abuse care. VA also provides services for homeless veterans, including transitional housing, paired with services to address the social, vocational, and mental health problems associated with homelessness. VA's vet centers provide counseling and readjustment services to returning war veterans. The vet center service mission goes beyond medical care in providing a holistic mix of services designed to treat each veteran as a whole person in the community setting. Vet centers provide an alternative to traditional access for some veterans who may be reluctant to come to our medical centers and clinics. Care for Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom veterans is among the high priorities in VA's mental health care system. Since the start of OEF-OIF, through the end of the first quarter of FY 2007, over 680,000 service members have been discharged and become eligible for VA care. Of those, over 229,000 have sought VA care. Of those who have sought care with VA, mental health problems are the second most commonly reported health concerns, with almost 37% reporting concerns suggesting a possible mental health diagnosis. Of those, PTSD was most frequently implicated, but non-dependent abuse of drugs and depressive orders are the next most commonly indicated and are also frequent. VA's data show that the proportion of new veterans seeking VA care who are identified as possibly having a mental health problem has climbed somewhat over the years. For example, the proportion with possible mental health problems at the end of FY 2005 was 31 percent, compared to 37 percent in the most recent report. For possible PTSD, the proportions at those time points were 13 percent and 17 percent. There are many possible explanations of this increase. We've discussed extended deployments, possibly more difficult combat circumstances, but we believe also that effective screening and outreach efforts help identify more uh, with possible mental health problems. And VA has also taken and continues to take um, to make efforts to destigmatize seeking mental health services. So regardless of the causes, there is an increase and VA is prepared to devote increasing resources to serving these growing mental health needs. 
The Mental Health Initiative provides funding for implementation of a VA's comprehensive mental health strategic plan. The plan recognizes, as part of its broad vision for enhancement of mental health care, that ongoing war efforts necessitate special attention to the needs of OEF, OIF veterans. We have improved capacity and access, supporting hiring so far of over 1,000 new mental health professionals with more in the pipeline. We have expanded mental health services in community-based outpatient clinics, with on-site staffing, or by telemental health. We have enhanced PTSD, homelessness, and substance abuse specialty care services and programs that recognize the common co-occurrence of these problems. We are fostering integration of mental health and primary care in medical facility clinics as well as the CBOX and in the care of homebound veterans served by VA's home-based primary care program. We have mental health staff well integrated in the polytrauma care sites and we are expanding the number of vet centers over the next two years. VA promotes early recognition of mental health problems with the goal of making evidence-based treatments available early to prevent chronicity and lasting impairment. Veterans are screened for PTSD on a routine basis through contact in primary care clinics. When there is a positive screen, patients are further evaluated and when indicated, referred to a mental health provider for follow-up. Veterans also are routinely screened in primary care for depression, substance abuse, traumatic brain injury, and military sexual trauma. Screening for this array of mental health problems helps support effective identification of veterans needing mental health services. I want to thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for having me here today, and I will be happy to answer any questions when we come to time for that. Thank you very much, Dr. Zeiss. Uh, Dr. Insel? Mr. Chairman, it's, um, I'm honored to be here, and I'm glad you thought to include someone from the NIH in this uh, this hearing. You have my written testimony, I think, given the time and the number of of uh, witnesses here. I I'm going to just uh, uh, very quickly summarize what I think is most important for us to think about. As you uh, listened, as I did to the first panel, I think it's important to recognize the sort of two classes of issues that we're hearing about. One class of issues has to do with what uh, many of the uh, people on the committee call the problems of stigma, the problems of the cracks in the system, uh, the ripple effect of mental illness on family members and on others. Uh, those are not unique to um, this war. They're not unique to this um, situation. And they're really problems that we have for a range of mental illnesses throughout the society. And as we think about what the fix is here and how we address them, uh, actually, we may be able to learn some things from what DOD and the VA are doing, which may, in fact, be ahead of the curve. Um, there are other issues, of course, that are going to be unique that have to do with the policies that came up in some of your questions, and uh, there'll be, I'm sure, an opportunity to talk more about those. But I, I want to go back to this issue about whether this may be an exemplar that we can learn from. Your first comments this morning, Mr. Chairman, involved a memo that you received from the LA County Department of Mental Health. And I think that's an important <laughs> signal to us that this is not simply a problem for the VA or for DOD. This is a problem for mental health care throughout the country. Much of the what we call the burden of illness, the public health challenge here, will spill over to the public sector to uh, mental health care in the civilian sector. And one of the questions I hope we'll have a chance to think about is, are we prepared for that? What will that burden look like? How many people are we talking about? And what are the resources uh, to address that? And I look forward to your questions and hopefully a chance to discuss those issues further. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Insel. Uh, Major General uh, Gail Pollack. Chairman Waxman and distinguished me members of the committee, thank you for providing me the opportunity to address you on this very important subject. I am Gail Pollack, Acting Surgeon General of the Army and Commander of the U.S. Army Medical Command. I'm here today to discuss the array of behavioral health services designed to support our warriors and their families. The United States Army Medical Command is an imperfect organization. 
the 34 military treatment facilities over which I exercise command authority are all imperfect organizations. We make mistakes. Despite cutting edge technology, healthcare still remains as much art as science. Sometimes, despite our best efforts and the best care, our patients still have tragic outcomes. Whenever we have less than optimal outcomes, it affects every one of us. To the soldiers and their family members on the first panel, I paused after the panel to extend my condolences for the pain and suffering that they have gone through. And I thank them for their courage to testify today. And I thank you because although the Army, the U.S. Army Medical Department is an imperfect organization, we are more importantly a striving organization because we strive to be perfect. We strive to improve every day and with every patient encounter. These tragic stories give us the opportunity to examine our systems and processes and do everything possible to ensure that whenever possible, these mistakes are not repeated. After every suboptimal outcome, our team can evaluate their performance, assess our processes, and determine if we can improve any aspect of the care we provide. On the battlefield, we know that the majority of our casualties die from loss of blood. Our clinicians and researchers fo focus their considerable intellect and effort on this reality and developed equipment, techniques, and procedures to save lives. The result is that 91% of warriors injured on the battlefield survive their wounds. And this rate of survival is unprecedented in the history of warfare. Yet it's still not perfect, and our researchers and experts continue to strive to find better ways to provide higher quality battlefield care to develop better products to stop bleeding, and to conduct better training to save more lives. We are equally committed to saving lives and improving lives where the injuries are not visible. Although an array of behavioral health services were available to our beneficiaries before the global war on terror began, they have steadily improved over the past five years as the identified needs of our populations have changed. Since the attacks on 9-11, the post-deployment health assessment was revised and updated, and in the fall of 2003, we launched the first mental health advisory team into theater. Never before had the mental health of combatants been studied in a systematic manner during conflict. Three subsequent mental health advisory teams in 2004, 5, and 6 continued to build upon the success of the original and further influence our policies and procedures, not only in theater, but before and after deployment as well. Based on those recommendations, we have increased the distribution of behavioral health providers and expertise throughout the combat theater, and access to care and quality of care have improved as a result. In 2004, researchers at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research published initial results of a groundbreaking land combat study, which provided insights related to the care and treatment of soldiers upon return from combat experiences and led to the development of the post-deployment health reassessment. In 2005, the Army rolled out the post-deployment health reassessment to provide soldiers with the opportunity to identify any new physical or behavioral health concern that they were experiencing that, would, that was not present immediately after their redeployment. This assessment includes an interview with a health care provider and has been very effective for identifying more of the soldiers, but unfortunately not all who are experiencing some of the symptoms of stress-related disorders and getting them the care they need before their symptoms manifest into more serious problems. We continue to review the effectiveness of this process and will add or edit questions as needed. In 2006, we piloted a program at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, intended to reduce the stigma of which many of us are very aware. The Respect.mil pilot program integrated behavioral health into the primary care setting, providing education, screening tools, and treatment guidelines to the primary care providers. It has been so successful at Fort Bragg that we're currently rolling that program out to 15 other sites across the Army. Also in 2006, the Army incorporated the Deployment Cycle Support Program uh, 
with a new training program called Battle Mind. Prior to this war, there had been no empirically validated studies to mitigate combat-related mental health problems. So we've been evaluating the post-deployment assessments and training now using scientifically rigorous methods with good initial results. It's a strength-based approach that highlights the skills that help soldiers survive in combat instead of focusing on the negative effects of combat. Our striving has continued in 2007 because we've expanded battle mind training with modules for pre-deployment training and for spouses. Our behavioral health website went live in March and I stood up a behavioral health proponency office specifically to deal with these issues. Our, a new PTSD training course starts in June and as you noted, the preliminary recommendations of the Mental Health Task Force were released in May with a final report expected this summer. Traumatic brain injury is emerging as a common blast-related injury. An overwhelming majority of these patients have mild and moderate concussive syndromes with symptoms not different from those experienced by athletes with a history of concussion. But many of these symptoms are similar to post-traumatic stress symptoms especially those of, the, of difficulty concentrating and irritability. However, we must not confuse TBI with PTSD. TBI is the result of physical damage to the brain and as such requires different screening, diagnosis, and treatment approaches. It's important that all providers are able to recognize these similarities and consider the effect of BLAST in their diagnosis. The Congress has provided Incredi incredible financial support to allow us to better understand and treat both PTSD and TBI. Let me thank you for that and assure you that we will invest the money in a focused manner that allows us to make a difference in the lives of soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen immediately. The Army and the Army Medical Department are committed to provide a level of care, physical, emotional, and spiritual that is equal to the quality of service provided by these great warriors. We recognize our imperfections and are striving daily to improve. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Fairbank, before I call on you, we're, we're, you might have heard the bells. That indicates that there are votes on the House floor. We're going to have to respond to those votes. There are four votes. Um, I think we better anticipate uh, reconvening at, um, well, it's, it's a quarter, maybe at um, 1, 145, give you a chance to get something to eat, and, um, and then we'll be back in this room at 145. I want to hear from you, and then we have questions for all Thank of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We stand in recess. Come back to order. Uh, Dr. Fairbank, we'd like to hear from you now. There's a button on the base of the mic. You should have pressed it in. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the members of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Veterans Compensation for Post Traumatic Stress Disorder. Our committee recently completed a report entitled PTSD Compensation and Military Service that addresses topics under consideration in this hearing. I'm here today to present a few of the conclusions of that report and to share my experience as a former VA psychologist and as a researcher on PTSD and veterans health. These remarks are a summary of my written testimony. I was asked to address whether there has been adequate preparation for the men and women returning home from Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom our committee's report makes several recommendations relevant to this question. Specifically, a review of the scientific literature and VA's current compensation and pension practices identifies areas where changes might result 
in more consistent and accurate ratings for disability associated with PTSD. There are two primary steps in the disability compensation process for veterans. The first of these is a compensation and pension, or CNP, examination. Testimony presented to my, to my committee indicated that clinicians often feel pressured to severely constrain the time that they devote to conducting a PTSD examination. The committee believes that the key to proper administration of VA's PTSD compensation program is a thorough CNP clinical examination conducted by an experienced mental health professional. Many of the problems and issues with the current process can be addressed by consistently allocating and applying the time and resources needed for a thorough examination. The committee recommended that a system-wide training program be implemented for the clinicians who conduct these exams in order to promote uniform and consistent evaluations. The second primary step in the compensation process is a rating of the level of disability associated with a veteran's service-connected disorders. The committee's review of VA's ratings practices found that the criteria used to evaluate the level of disability resulting from service-connected PTSD were, at best, crude and overly general. It recommended that new criteria be developed and applied. As part of this effort, the committee suggested that VA take a broader and more comprehensive view of what constitutes PTSD disability. The committee believes that the current criteria unduly penalize veterans who may be capable of working, but who are significantly symptomatic or impaired in other dimensions, and may thus serve as a disincentive to both work and recovery. In order to promote more accurate, consistent, and uniform PTSD disability ratings, the committee also recommended that VA establish a certification program for raters who deal with PTSD claims. Rater certification should foster greater confidence in ratings decisions and in the decision-making process. Earlier in my career, I was a co-principal investigator for the National Vietnam Veterans Readjustment Study, the NVVRS, and served as a VA staff psychologist working primarily with Vietnam War combat veterans. I was asked to comment on what the lessons of Vietnam tell us about today. And first, I'd like to make clear at the, uh, that our committee's report did not address this topic and that these are my own observations. The intent of the NVVRS was to provide an empirical basis for the formulation of policy related to Vietnam veterans' psychosocial health, especially PTSD. In a 1992 paper, my colleagues and I reported that families of veterans with PTSD were more likely to suffer domestic violence than the families of veterans without PTSD. In addition, we found that children of the veterans with PTSD manifested significantly higher levels of behavioral and emotional problems than children of veterans without PTSD, and that more than one-third of veterans with PTSD had a child with behavioral or emotional problems. In my opinion, this finding of multiple severe problems in the families of veterans with PTSD made 15 years after the end of the Vietnam War has important implications for today's servicemen and women returning from OIF, OEF. Specifically, our Vietnam-era findings suggest that a significant number of current members of our armed forces will need access to effective treatments for war-related PTSD and its comorbid conditions. And similarly, their spouses and children will need access to trauma-informed treatments and services. A hard lesson learned from our nation's response to Vietnam veterans is that we do not want to delay doing our best to prevent war-related PTSD from wreaking havoc on the futures of our OIF, OEF veterans and their families. An enduring and distressing memory of my work as a VA psychologist was trying to help veterans and their spouses process and recover from the shock, disappointment, anger, and sense of betrayal that so often accompany denial of benefits or compensation for the psychological and emotional toll that war zone stress had taken on their lives in the form of PTSD. More often than not, a profound sense of unfairness lay at the heart of their reactions. The PTSD CMP evaluation and disability ratings process has improved considerably since the late 1980s, but as our committee's report suggests, much more may be done to enhance confidence in PTSD compensation ratings decisions and ultimately to improve this process for veterans returning from combat and for their families. Thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to respond to your question. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fairbanks. I'm going to uh, start off the questions. I want to see if I can understand the scope of this problem uh, and, of course, whether DOD and Veterans Administration are prepared for it. The results of surveys done by the Army and 
Department of Defense are alarming, a comprehensive analysis conducted in 2003 estimated 13 percent of soldiers returning from war in Iraq and Afghanistan had PTSD. Uh, Dr. Insel referred to this estimate in his testimony. We know that there are about 1.5 million troops that have been deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. Just doing the simple math, this suggests that approximately 160,000 troops will return home needing treatment for PTSD. Dr. Insel, does that figure sound right to you? As far as we know, I think that's right. But I want to um, point out that we're at the early stages. And what we learned in Vietnam is this takes a sometimes unpredictable longitudinal course and that there are people who develop the disorder sometimes months, sometimes years after they return from a service. So uh, one needs to be a little cautious with any of the percentages that we're working with at this point. Mm -hmm. Dr. Um, Kilpatrick and General uh, Pollack, is this consistent with the DOD and the Army, uh, what you're seeing? Again, I think it's very important to understand what the statistics are that are being quoted as we are taking a look at our screening processes, both the, the research studies done in theater and the studies on the post-deployment health assessment, uh, we're looking at people answering questions in a positive way that would indicate uh, that they need further evaluation to make a diagnosis of PTSD. The screening questions that are being asked are not diagnostic questions. And so I think that that, that percentage needs to then say the next step, what do we know as far as the number of those people who are actually diagnosed with PTSD? I think as you just heard from Dr. Fairbanks, that, that diagnosis is not one that, that can be done quickly. It, it may take an hour, it may take several days, and I think as Dr. Insull has just said, and the symptoms today that going through that diagnostic workup may not be diagnosed as PTSD mm -hmm. end up several years later uh, perhaps being diagnosed as PTSD. So I think that this is a very hard area to try to identify quickly. We have no... Identify test, quickly no, or, no, quant or quantify no, the number? That I think to try to quantify it is very yeah. difficult because it's going to be an evolving process. I think people screening positive, we have to understand, is different than people being diagnosed. And then people being diagnosed, uh, we have to really understand the extent of their illness, how... how severe right. it is and whether it's in the chronic phase or hopefully with our processes we're identifying it early and being able to treat. What we, what we heard from the first panel is that a lot of them feel it's a stigma to come forward and to um, uh, indicate that they might be suffering from mental uh, illness. Uh, uh, General Pollack, did you want yeah, to yeah, jump Yes, in sir. On? It's because of the stigma that I would be unwilling to even estimate what numbers are because until we're able to eliminate the, the stigma, people who are suffering won't come forward, uh, whether it's for fear of their letting their buddies down, fear of being seen as weak, fear of what will happen to my career. If something happens to my career, how will I take care of my family? Well, I'll, I can just tough through this. I'm army strong. There are so many factors right now that are affecting that. And until we're able to reduce that stigma, those numbers are going to be, I, I'm afraid, just guesses. Well, the, stigma, the, the stigma is a problem, but it seems to me that the, uh, the Army and the Veterans Administration need to figure out how to ask questions that go to the symptoms so that they're not stigmatizing by saying, do you have post-traumatic syndrome of one sort or oh, another? Oh, I agree, sir. And one of the things that we're doing now, this is a new piece. I mentioned mm -hmm. before, we're always trying to add something new to make it better. We're working on a, a leader training program, but a leader being because at any point in time, a soldier can be placed into a leadership position. So it's not for senior leaders. It's for every soldier mm -hmm. to say, these are the symptoms. These are some of the ways that a, another soldier, one of your buddies, can manifest that they may be suffering from PTSD. This is how you can recognize it. This is what you can do to help them. 
And just like you'd watch their back if you were out on a battlefield, you continue to watch their back and help each other. Excuse me. We're in we're doing more work with the spouses now and encouraging the spouses to come in when we do the three to six month reassessment to say, have you noticed anything different? Is it, you know, is it harder for you two to get along? Is there more stress in the family? So that we can really bring people in so they get permission to talk about it. So we're trying to move forward, but I, I submit the stigma piece will continue to be a challenge. And then as we erase that, it will look like our numbers are much larger because then people are willing to admit, you know, yeah, I think I'd like some help. But the point that Dr. Insel made early this morning with the fact that we have inadequate behavioral health professionals across our nation, we can break down the stigma, but if we don't have people who can step up and assist, have we really done anything? And I really think that we need as a nation, not just as a military, to look at how can we get more people into behavioral health so that we can serve the needs of the men and women of America, not just the men and women in the military. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Dyson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Or Dr. Kilpatrick. Uh, you had a lot of superlatives in your presentation, and I was a little surprised that there were there were quite as many of them as there were terms like robust and uh, touting uh, <clears throat> surveillance programs, pre-deployment health assessments since 98, uh, mental health care in theater, uh, the use of multi-faith uh, chaplains, et cetera, et cetera, is in your testimony. How do you explain the first panel? Uh, you know, Dr. Pollack did, I think, did a very, or General Pollack did a very good job of, uh, of saying, look, we make mistakes, things fall through the cracks. You didn't do that in your testimony, and I was a little surprised that in light of what this, what we're looking at here and, and some potentials for falling through the cracks, that, that it was sort of, geez, this thing says nothing's broken. I, again, let me kind of start with saying that, that the programs we have in place are programs that the DOD has never had before. In the Gulf War, we had nothing electronic, and today we do. And I think that's a major step forward. The fact that we're able to track and, and say where people are, what are their medical problems, I think is a major advance. Well, now, I, think, I think it's important and it's, it's major, but I did a little back of the envelope, and do you have 400 psychiatrists and psychologists on staff at DOD? If we look throughout DOD, you can, you can see that number, but I think that... Because that, that would be approximately what it would take if you took a couple of hours for pre-deployment evaluation or base level evaluation and then a, fo a follow-up post without in theater and without any other uh, psychiatric work, just sort of doing, you know, 250 uh, uh, people a day or 250 days in a year, uh, roughly four people a day. I'm going through the math and saying, I'll bet you don't have 400 psychiatrists and psychologists uh, that are doing it just for those de before they deploy and after they get back. Okay. So, you know, what do you, what do you need, and why is it you're not here saying that inherently the resources necessary to provide the kind of pre-evaluation where we wouldn't be deploying people who were at high risk and the kind of evaluation coming back so they wouldn't have uh, tragedies like we saw on the first panel? Why is it you're not asking for those kind of resources? Well, again, I think as we take a look at what are the resource requirements, we're really looking at the mental health task force. We believe that they have spent a year and a half or over a year looking at this with all the data that we could make available to them. Uh, their early report, as you've seen, said that, that there are inadequate resources, mainly people is what they're talking about, to be able to do this. The question is, yeah. where, where and, do we and, need and to have right. them? Right. And I'm... And I'm thrilled that they've done this kind of work, and I'm thrilled that the Veterans Administration, which, as I understand, is the best health care delivery system in America, public or private, uh, sought to make it better. But I, again, uh, I'm going to go on to uh, General Pollack, but I would really hope that when you testify before Congress, you come with the problems, not the, just the superlatives. Dr. Pollack, or I'm sorry, General Pollack, uh, both titles are good, and, and you certainly earned the, uh, the stars. We're, uh, in the first panel, which you were there for, what we saw were things that I remember from my days as an enlisted man and as a young officer. We saw people who had 
in the case of uh, Specialist Smith, he had a profile that kept him from performing his mission. Then he was deployed, came back with symptoms, mental health problems that may or may not have been, been IED related. And today he's still an active duty specialist and still in a sense in denial that he can't do the job and that the likelihood uh, is that as long as he can't carry a weapon and needs medication, he's not going to be able to do it. How are we getting people out of what I call the penalty box or the suspension box? The idea that you're on a profile, your promotions are going to be reduced, your ability to do the things it takes for a career aren't going to be there, and yet he's got quite a few years in, in limbo, to use an old Catholic term. I think we're making progress on that, and we've started at Walter Reed. One of the things that we were very concerned about was the lack of continuity of care when they were outpatients. How are we really being accountable for them? And that was also evidenced by the tragedy that the parents talked about. So now we've put together a, a triad. So we have a nurse case manager to make sure that all the pieces and the appointments and the um, coordination that needs to be done for that soldier in their care is occurring. We've got either a sergeant or a company commander. So we'll have a platoon sergeant and a squad sergeant so that we don't have more than 12 of, of the soldiers, warriors in transition. So whether they were battle injuries or other illnesses or a training injury, if they're going to require a profile and can't be immediately sent back to duty, they'll be assigned to a warrior transition unit. Are so, these like the wounded warrior facilities at Camp Pendleton and Quantico and so on? Yes, yes. And by doing that, their purpose then, the focus of their day will be to get well and to participate in the care that they need. And with the other staff there to help them get through the process and to understand why they're waiting two weeks between a behavioral health appointment. Is it that people aren't available? No, it's because you have homework that you have to do. There's pieces that you have to pay attention to. So I think that we're going to fix that. And then the stress that Specialist Smith was under inside his unit, you need to go again, you know, tough it up, let's go again. We're going to be allowing the commanders of those units to say, this person is not deployable. They have a profile. We'd like to transition them to the warrior transition unit so that I can have the fill of my unit of the healthy, ready to go folks so that we can just train to go back and do what we need to do. Thank and you, that's going you. to, that's going to correct quite a bit of this problem. Thank you very much, uh, General Pollack. Mr. Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've heard a lot today about um, the deployments, length, length of deployments and the redeployments and the, the shortened dwell time. And in, in the case of the specialist we had here, as, as short as eight months between deployments and the impact that that has on families, but also on uh, <clears throat> mental health. I'd like to address Dr. Fairbanks. I know it's not your job to tell the military how to fight wars, but from a clinical perspective, could you tell us what the impact of all of these short, these lengthened deployments, uh, shortened dwell times, and uh, the multiple deployments will have on the soldier's mental health, whether or not they end up as, as clinically P, uh, PTSD or um, some other way affected mentally? I, I can address it from uh, two perspectives. Um, what we know from the National Vietnam Veterans Readjustment Study, um, where we looked at the number of months that a, um, that a service member uh, served in the Vietnam Theater of Operations, there's, when you, uh, if you start at the 12-month mark um, and go on out, there's basically a dose-response relationship between time in theater and prevalence of PTSD. So for example, I believe the uh, prevalence rate is about 13.5% for men who served, men and women who served, uh, well men primarily, who served um, 12 months. 13 months to 23 months, it's about 18.5%. Um, Those who served two years or more, um, it starts to get up to around 19, 20% PTSD prevalence. So um, we even know from the Vietnam era that there's a strong relationship between time in theater and, and very likely uh, the level of exposure to the types of traumatic events that 
um, that are related to development of PTSD. Um, the, the second observation I would have is that um, when I was working at the Jackson VA Medical Center from 1979 to 1987, basically every day working with Vietnam veterans and other era veterans with PTSD, um, the most complex and refractory cases that I saw were veterans with three or more tours. Um, they were um, by far, they're, they're the most memorable cases of individuals that I worked with. Well, and clarify something for me. When we're talking about PTSD, uh, I am sure there is a wide range of the manifestation of uh, PTSD in terms of how disabling it can be and the severity yeah. of symptoms and so forth. I mean, I would, not having served in combat, I would assume that anyone who's been in a combat situation has seen what uh, Specialist Smith and, and Bloodworth described to us this morning would be in some way affected adversely mentally, and I can't, can't imagine the, the opposite. Uh, so when we're talking about this, d does prolonged experience increase the severity of it and, and the disabling aspects of it? Or, um, for instance, when he was, uh, Specialist Smith was sent back with and clearly was, was having a problem before his second deployment. Uh, how, how much does that exacerbate the situation? Well, I think it, um, it was um, Mr. Smith who I, I thought very uh, vividly described what it was like um, being on patrol every day, um, the threat that he was facing each day, uh, the sniper fire, the IEDs. Um, that would clearly qualify as high level of exposure to um, war zone stress, traumatic stress. So um, both of the service members who testified uh, presented um, pretty clear evidence that while they were there, they were under um, high levels of, of traumatic stress exposure. What we do know from the research is that there's a dose response relationship that the higher the level of exposure to trauma, the greater the risk for developing not only PTSD, but a wide range of other often comorbid conditions like substance use, dependence, abuse, major depression, other types of anxiety disorders. So there is a relationship between the level of exposure. So to the extent that um, these multiple tours and extended tours increase one's level of exposure to the types of things that they describe, the probability of developing these adverse psych psychological reactions increases. I have a quick question I want to get in for General Pollack, and I appreciate your assessment of the imperfection of, of the system and so forth. Um, when we're talking about these deployments and the shortened dwell times, we all know by reading news accounts and so forth that um, we're, our armed forces are strained, and we are because we're we don't have enough people to send to the theater that we're sending people uh, in ways that we don't ordinarily do. Are we treating PTSD patients and our so affected soldiers and others differently than we would because of the fact that we we're strained, we're stressed so so much for our uh, personnel in the service? Are we doing things that we ordinarily wouldn't do? The way that we're we're treating the patients really depends on how they present. And again, I, I have great concerns that it's related to the stigma because they're not often willing to tell us what's really going on for them. And they're bonding with their, sol their soldier colleagues. Gee, if I, if I go tell too many people about this, they'll put me on a profile and I'm gonna have abandoned my buddies. I'd rather stay with my buddies. So they don't always tell us. Um, that's why the different types of training that we're trying to get out now and the different venues to get through so that they're all supporting one another better, I think will be helpful. But it's just going to be very, very difficult, but we're going to keep after it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yarmuth. Uh, we have votes on the House floor, and I gather this vote is a very close one. I was willing to miss it. But I don't want to ask the panel to... Uh, stay here and wait for us to come back. 
uh, I thank you for being here and you're giving us your testimony. We would like to send you additional questions in writing and have you respond in writing for the record. We, we need to, of course, deal with this problem. It's, a, it's an enormous public uh, health threat. Uh, our uh, brave men and women are putting their lives on the line, need, uh, need us to be there for them. I know you're all trying to do the best you can. We're here to work with you to be sure we do the job. And working with you may be to give you a push, but also to give you the resources and, uh, and uh, ability to follow through. Thank you very much for being here. The, that uh, concludes our hearing, and we stand adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On tomorrow's Washington Journal, a conversation with Jerry Corsi of WorldNetDaily.com about federal government operations during a national emergency. Later, author James Mann on U.S.-China relations. His book is called